just uh, Thank you. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, members of Shoulder Elbow Society of India and Indian Orthoscopy Society and viewers of uh, Auto TV and viewers from United States of America. Uh, it's a great uh, privilege to have these three societies uh, together. Uh, the Indian American Shoulder Elbow uh, Surgeons mm -hmm. Group was uh, formed last year, led by uh, Dr. Suman Krishnan. And Samir Nagda and uh, Paul Sethi, uh, George at Paul, to name a few, but there are a lot of surgeons uh, joining. Uh, now, we had a first collaboration meeting in last year, uh, which included a case discussion, which was well received, which was also live transmitted through Auto TV. And this time, we are also collaborating with Indian Orthoscopy Society. Uh, we welcome the Indian Orthoscopy Society uh, President, uh, IPS Oberoi, uh, Secretary uh, Sundarajan, all the members. And share is coping with international uh, joining on uh, uh, academic program for IAS. Uh, now, uh, today uh, the program is going to be, I just let me share my uh, screen so you can see that. Okay, that's the uh, program uh, for uh, today. Uh, these plans. Three session of 45 minutes each and the uh, idea is to cases and we have a great uh, list of expert panel United States of America and India. So we have with us uh, today uh, participating as a uh, um, panelist and moderate uh, Dr. Andrew Jawa, shoulder uh, hand uh, specialist in Boston. We have uh, Anup Shah uh, from uh, Houston from uh, Dr. Uma uh, Shrikumaran from Howard, uh, Dr. from Chicago, uh, Dr. Mandeep Kirk from New York, and we have our own uh, expert faculties, Dr. Sanjay Desai from Mumbai, Dr. Jidendra Maheshwari from Delhi, Dr. Vivek from Ames, Delhi, Dr. Ashish Papunkar from Pune, Dr. Padiva from Mumbai, Dr. Sundar Rajan from uh, Coimbatore, Dr. Kane Subramaniam from uh, Shreyas Gajar from Mumbai, Dr. IPS Oberoi from Delhi, Monday from Manipal, Dr. Karthik Silvaraj from uh, Coimbatore. We have a star studded uh, uh, faculty, uh, both as moderator and, and uh, we have uh, experts also joining in the uh, Zoom meeting. They will be also participating, interacting uh, uh, here as well. Uh, so. With that uh, introduction, I would ask a request to Dr. Rada to say uh, a few words before we proceed to the scientific session. Thank you, Sam. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ram. And uh, Ram, Dr. Oboy, is just in our society to be uh, in, uh, you know, in, in the meeting with you all. It's been a vision from uh, Paul Sethi, Anand Murthy, uh, Anshu Singh, and myself um, from, you know, two years ago, we had this idea to collaborate together as a group of Indian surgeons in the United States and work with the Indian surgeons and the talented surgeons you guys all have in India to work together to just, you know, Im improve all of our knowledge and just, you know, grow the care that we can provide to uh, people all over the world. Um, and just to see that all of us are together here, uh, participating and meeting together, both the IAS and SESI, as well as our little society. You know, at the last meeting that we had, six, uh, what, four, three, four months ago, we had six or seven members. Now we have a uh, 50, and we hope to continue to grow our membership society as we you know, continue to flourish with, uh, in a collaboration with you guys. So for, proud of all of our members and all of our collaboration with you. I look forward to what everyone has to say tonight and, uh, you know, uh, I'll take it over to you if you have a few words to say. Uh, logged in. I, Otherwise, I, I just. Uh, I couldn't uh, see IPS yeah. yet. Can so, you say? Uh, yeah, on behalf of the Indian Arthros 
uh, really it's a great honor to collaborate with uh, uh, the Indian American group, the Shoulder and Elbow Society. Uh, I must clarify that society and the Indian Arthroscopy Society are actually one unit. So, you know, obviously we have sub-societies, but we are all uh, a big uh, group. Really, we are looking forward to this scientific session and we look forward to, uh, you know, many such uh, interactions in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll just move to the scientific session. So I, I, I also came to know that uh, this is the ASES 2021 Virtual Specialty Day meeting tonight. Is that right? Uh, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow, but it is tonight. Yes, <laughs> right. So we're, we're, on, we're on Friday night. In, yes, in yes. But yes, it's... This registration is open, uh, is uh, free. Uh, you have to register to see it. So I have already registered. So I would just uh, put that message across to all members of Solar Rebel Society of India. So the meeting starts at tonight at 8.30 p.m. Indian time. Uh, so, so we are going to talk about proximal human fractures for the next minutes. We will show you a few cases. We have faculty here, uh, Dr. Andrew uh, Jawa from uh, Boston and Dr. from Houston. And we have Dr. Sanjay Desai. Uh, uh, President of the Asian Shoulder Elbow Society and the Shoulder and Knee Specialist Surgeon from PND Hospital, Mumbai, and Dr. Jitendra Maheshwari, uh, past President of Society of India and Director of uh, Max Super Specialty Hospital, Delhi, and Dr. Vivek Traika uh, is, is a Director of uh, Orthopedic Trauma at All India Institute of Medical Science, Delhi, as a rich uh, AO trauma expert. So we have a star faculty here as a uh, expert panelist. So we'll, we'll start uh, with the uh, discussion. Uh, this is my uh, uh, setup, Chennai, India. I run a own private center, as well as uh, affiliated to MGM Healthcare, as well as shoulder and hand sports injuries at Chennai. So let us start with uh, uh, case uh, one. So a 62-year-old, sorry, a 62-year-old ex-military gentleman, uh, fit and healthy, nil medical issues, fall from ladder one month ago, treated by nat native bandaging, that means the arm was bound to the chair, some oil and bandage, uh, strict immobilization. Uh, on the left is the initial x-ray. On, on the right side, you have a current x-ray. Uh, there is no lateral view done. Uh, any uh, comments to start with, Andrew? Yeah, I'm looking at this, it's a, it's a month out. Um, it's generally in, in position, slight varus, uh, neck fracture. I, I do need to see some healing here. Uh, if this came in to me at, at this point, um, certainly I, I would have a discussion about how active he is. It sounds like he's quite fit. Uh, given this, I would treat this non-operatively, um, conservatively, and watch this and, and start moving this uh, when he felt comfortable, probably at this point. Yeah. At one month, you would start mobilization anyway? Yeah, actually, one of these fractures, people feel to move. Um, it doesn't seem to affect displacement, and it seems to um, encourage them to get better motion early on. It's when they're ready to move. I find this in older men, older women, um, that it seems to work quite well. And would you like to do any further investigation before deciding to go conservative? Yeah, I it does, I mean, I, as you push me a little bit, I mean, it looks relatively <laughs> normal. Is it possible pathological? Yes. Uh, you know, as I look at it a little bit closer, it does look a little bit funny to me. I would consider, you know, okay. getting a, a CT scan, MRI, see if there's something pathological going on here. Let's see what Anup has to say. So I, I really agree with Andrew, I think, um, on initial uh, evaluation of the films with, you know, a single image and anterior posterior view. I would say the alignment is acceptable for a 62 year old gentleman. Agree. Slight varus, maybe, especially since the arm was not immobilized initially. So he may have had some motion and caused displacement. But as Andrew alluded to, there's evidence of some early callus on the lateral side um, and soft lines. But 
that central lesion in the head does look a little pathologic, or there may be lesion as well as those lytic lesions um, along the humeral head. Uh, if there was no history um, and no constitutional symptoms or anything that was nothing super concerned um, about that, then I may actually uh, just watch um, unless colleges had something to, uh, uh, to clarify. There is no clinical symptoms of it. Uh, Sanjay, what do you think of? Uh, no. <clears throat> I would uh, do a CT scan to ensure that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, displaced in the other plane. So I think they were concerned about the greater tuberosity displacement as well as the head alignment. So yeah. that's the relevant, relevant images. How would you go about? See that uh, the with acromion, there was some subacromial sclerosis, but he denies any history of pre-existing shoulder pain. Yeah. So, what is your plan? Ram, are you asking me? Yes. This is his non dominant I presume. Uh, yes. Uh, is it? Yeah. Uh, dominant side. Is one month down the line. I will. I will talk to the patient. I will counsel him, and. Uh, and explain to him that now it is four weeks down the line, and if we continue with conservative treatment, then he may end up with about 60 or percent of shoulder function. If that is acceptable to him, I will continue with conservative treatment. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jidendra Maheshwari. Uh, Dr. Jitendra, are you on? So, I will more or less agree with previous speakers, except that I would warn the patient that considering that GT is high and also there is a lateral spike in the acromion, that he might land up with some impingement for which I may go in at a later date and do a subacromial decompression. Apart from that, uh, I'm going to be conservative. That's the best at this stage. Nothing better can be done. Yeah, it's, it's a question of will heal, but it's a question of uh, mall union and uh, restriction of function. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Vivek, Vivek Traika? No, it's, it's the same. Conservative right now with the alignment will maintain, start <coughs> mobilization as early as possible for me <coughs> at one month. Okay. This, uh, uh, thank you. I think it's a phenomenal agreement. On the show, on the expert shoulder elbow uh, surgeon, shoulder surgeon's opinion that you go try conservative is very important because he was advised the surgery elsewhere. So, Ram, may I, Ram, may I ask yes. what the panel will do on day one? Yeah, yes, that's a good question. <laughs> go back, Andrew. Yeah, I honestly, I oh. sure, I, I will admit to you, I am quite conservative relative to many of my colleagues here in the U.S., I, I would talk with him, but I still probably would have treated this conservatively. Okay. Conservative. No, okay. I, I would have treated it non-operatively. I definitely think some on the panel here uh, legitimately, I think we disagree, would probably fix it, uh, but I think uh, I would treat it conservatively. I know. So if this was the first time I was seeing the patient with the x-ray on the left, I'd want, you know, um, orthogonal views, and if that was unable to be done because of pain or whatnot, I would have jumped to a CT scan to assess fracture um, alignment and displacement and make my decision. But I too am very conservative about treating these proximal humerus fractures. Um, <clears throat> and I think that with displacement um, of the greater tuberosity in this uh, instance, if it was significant, um, then I would have considered it. Right now, based off the CT scan that we have, and even that initial film, I probably would treat it conservatively with the cuff and collar initially. Sanjay? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I would consider doing uh, percutaneous wiring in this patient had he come to me on day one with this CT scan. Okay. Vivek? 
conservative right now and even on day 1 so yeah. um, i i yes. would come I in mean, i'll agree with sanjay and how to percutaneous fixation because this is uh, not a real impacted fracture it is a fracture Three just, it is it is just below the a good area of the neck it is just like sub 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 con, uh, you can say below the head fracture it can displace gt can always displace i wouldn't take that chance so i'll put everything in proper place with the percutaneous fixation so that i can more or less be sure that he will end up like this as the first x ray is one month later okay uh, i think there is a agreement that if we decide to treat non operative now when is lately presenting with some callus but he had to warn the patient of uh, uh, molunion but if the patient has come uh, originally in the first place we might consider percutaneous fixation uh, i think we can now see the opinion or shall we move i think we move ahead so that patient is after conservative treatment because the, i thought is is a three part fracture the left velocity is still intact uh, and uh, there is some callus forming and it's been already immobilized so i just started to mobilize the shoulder uh, that is after conservative treatment uh, healed and that is a range of movement sorry is a left shoulder okay the internal rotation is not uh, full uh, reasonable movement in the range of flexion of that so question is there is a role for conservative treatment if you see there is a, already a callus a late presenting three part fracture but also in a two part fracture and the second most important thing is uh, in my opinion uh, what is that when you are in a dilemma you go for conservative your thoughts about it that's uh, as per the proper trial yeah that's right i think i agree with you uh, now at this stage i would ask the patient what's bothering him and what are the options for him uh, to me it looks quite reasonable he can manage his life like this if there's an issue we can consider surgical option like arthroscopy yes yeah. move on to the next case a uh, 48 year old lady uh, she has nil medical problem apart from seasonal bronchitis in a road traffic accident 2013 uh, she had a right shoulder injury so dominant hand neurological deficit in set of x-rays i see so i saw the patient later on so this is the first set of x rays the patient had uh, again very important to stress there were no lateral views i think it may be possible to do a, 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 as much lateral view as possible or at least do a couple of bilateral to check the uh, dislocation but it is all here that it is a fracture dislocation ct scan apparently was done but images were not available to me so we'll start with uh, uh, andrew Yeah, sure. So obviously fracture CT uh fracture dislocation pulses are okay, vascularity and ner- and nerve function is okay. Yes. Okay. I mean that's one of my concerns in this is um I- I've seen a fracture like this where everything looks okay, pulse is okay. I would have vascular surgery available uh because you can take that head out. It could be underneath the conjoint. It could be very difficult and could uh very much start bleeding and it could be a disaster so i'd be concerned about that number 1 um she's very young um and so this needs to be have a surgical intervention um for me i think there's a couple ways to go um i would actually try and fix this knowing that there's a high chance that you go on to avn um but my thought would be you can get the tuberosities in the right place you could come back and do a better arthroplasty than if you do a hemi arthroplasty right away but don't have vascular surgery available uh, for this year sanjay yeah ram uh, <clears throat> i agree uh, with the previous speaker would we'll check the pulses and any nerve damage and presuming that all is okay i would do a just unique intramedullary fixation device which uh, people from this part of the world are aware but if our american colleagues are not familiar 
if time permits, I can show you two, three slides of an exactly similar uh, case. Uh, yeah, but that sure. would be my choice. So uh, uh, just make is an intramedullary staple like device uh, used intramedullary and try to get hold of the head and reduction it, reduce it. Uh, Sanjay, you can show the few slides as, as I, fin after I finish. Okay. Uh, after finish this case because this case uh, differently dealt with. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, is uh, Vivek? And you have a series of uh, 40 fracture dislocation. Yeah. Now it is more than 70, 75 cases. Tell us, which tell us we have your done. experience of this case. So, so what I will say is that for me, in a young patient, which is less than 55 for me in our population group, salvage. Retrieval of this head back to its position and fixation with a proximal humerus plate is going to give us the best, very reasonable and one of the best outcomes that I have seen yeah. in our most of our hands in the sick part of our country. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, Anup. Yeah, I agree with uh, Vivek and Andrew. I think ORIF with the plate. With plate I yeah. have very little experience with intramedullary uh, nail fixation. Um, unless it's a pathologic fracture, you know, in the proximal humeral shaft or humeral shaft. Yeah. Um, I am concerned about ADN, and I think, you know, a lot of us have talked about this, that maybe okay. some of those numbers are inflated. Um, again, agree with the vascular uh, on standby for sure. Did you interrupt? Yeah, I think I'll fix it, but I'll keep a fibula handy. Oh. Um, there are going to be a lot of bone loss, and it may not be a very good fixation just by plate. Uh, may, may not be required, but you will keep in hand because of the combination. Yeah, yeah. If I can jet in out here, I find that in our young, when we have these fracture dislocations, once you are able to reduce it, the problem is reducing this and bringing back that shoulder, that hip, uh, that femoral sure. head back to its place. Once you are able to reduce it, you will find that the shaft and the sentence line becomes very anatomical and it fits into its place. Yeah. And yes, you can use some of the bone. But fibula, I think, will be a big too much for this. I might put in some bone substitute or iliac crest if I feel that there is a void on the medial side, which is not giving me the medial hinge. But fibula for me will add more soft tissue damage to this and may also disturb the remaining vascularity which this patient is going to be having in the humeral head. <laughs> Agreed, just to add to the uh, just agree that because in the fresh case scenario you might not need it yeah. in a chronic non-union is a different case scenario so i think we uh, agree uh, more or less this is a surgical emergency ct scan is planning surgery uh, general uh, mostly surgeons agree to do orif but it's important to meticulously handle the tuberosity and repair so these were the post-operative x-rays uh, we start with uh, uh, Sanjay, for comments. This is the on the left side is the immediate X-ray. On, on the right side is one month later at the same center. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm very uh, anxious about the outcome of this fixation that has been done. Yes. And uh, uh, if I may, can you remind me, this is how many, this is immediate post-op, I guess. I can see the staples. Staples. Yeah. On the right, one month later. Yeah. And uh, would you know whether any grafting was done? No grafting. Yeah. So I think this is heading towards a failure of plating. If I'm a little bold in in. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Agree. Uh, so, uh, and this, this smells trouble to me. Yes. Andrew, comments? I would agree with this smelling trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fixation is lost, obviously. The thing that is most concerning to me is I, I don't see the tuberosity, the greater tuberosity at all, which is really the key, in my opinion, to getting this right. Even if the head failed, exactly. you can do a hemi later, even a reverse. She's young for, I, I give you that, but that would be the key. With the, the tuberosity gone, certainly I would get a CT, maybe it's posterior, but I, unfortunately, such a young person, this may be crazy to say, I think we're looking at a reverse very soon. Very um, soon. But this is a difficult, this is a difficult situation. Yes. Hello? 
Yeah, this is a clearly failing. You know, you've got um, a change in alignment of the head. If you look at the cow car, uh, looks like it might be penetrating. The wires are loose, so we're definitely going down um, this problem route. Um, <clears throat> conversion of this to a hemi and then ultimately to a reverse is probably not the best option. So as Andrew said, reversing a young patient, while not ideal, um, that seems to be uh, the next step. There is one thing that I will um, also say is I do perform one to two hemiarthroplasties a year um, for cases very similar to this. Mm -hmm. And it's really done at the time. It's a decision that I make at the time of surgery on how good the cancellous bone is in the humeral head, because this almost looks like an anatomic neck as opposed to a surgical neck and really getting adequate screw length and to get purchase into the uh, humeral head can be quite challenging, especially with the spread of all the proximal humerus plates that exist. Every single one sits anterolateral and really obtaining a perfect screw trajectory on a sawbones is very different than putting this mess together in the operating room um, with rotation and provisional fixation with K wires. And so in a lot of cases, I've actually done a hemi um, and then with a convertible stem where a portion of it can be removed. So if you had to bail out to a reverse, the tuberosities and whatnot, if they're still there, may help you um, yeah. with range of motion later. So, Yeah, uh, the key here, uh, the key is the poor reduction to start with. So without good reduction, it's, it's very difficult to talk about the fixation. Fixation comes second. Vivek, your comments? Yeah, that's what we shouldn't be blaming the poor fracture to for all the reasons I would say. It's clearly a not properly done surgery. You can see that there is no fixation for the lower part. If you see the previous AP X-ray, you will find that all the lower down three screws or five screw holes are empty, and which is the key strap for your proximal for these filos plates, as well as where the those encyclage or that wire is, maybe it has come out. I would think that actually he had fixed it and it has just not been able to do it. You are right. I think the, the surgeon has done some suckler wire. At three months, she started to develop serious discharge from the wound, which, uh, as per the notes, which did not decrease with medication. So she underwent the second operation, the removal of that wires and the anesthesia. And only that. Ram, can I make a comment before you yes, proceed? Please. Yes. Yeah. So I think one comment I want to make is as on day one, the most dramatic aspect of this injury is dislocated head, which is something that carries the surgeon away. And he's more focused on getting the head back and fixing with all the wire or whatever graft that has been put medially and where to put the plate and, you know, all kind of screws. But what is missed is the most crucial part of surgery is the GT. Yes. And I've seen a number of cases where surgeon has spent 90% of the time fixing the head and shaft together and five minutes for just fixing the GT wherever it belongs and the GT pulls off. And the biggest disaster is nothing, no avian, no screw penetration. It is the loss of GT where yes. it becomes more or less a drop arm case. So I think my message to beginners are concentrate on rotator cuff and GT more than even head. Even if head is fixed here and there, doesn't really matter. Yeah. Even if the head goes avian, doesn't really matter. But exactly. if your GT flies away and you don't spend time to fix it well, that's the bigger disaster, as in I, this case. I, I agree with that 100%. Because GT is important for both fixation as well as hemi. Very yeah. important. Okay. Uh, we just move on. Uh, the surgeon did not do uh, anything further. And that is the patient six months post-op developed severe pain as uh, predicted by Dr. Sanjay Desai is, is bound to go in that route only because it is a lot to plate. The, uh, the screw cannot go back up. So the head will collapse. The screw will penetrate the head. It's now starting to the clinoid. And uh, now what? So now still the GT is not visualized. The screw penetration is there into the clinoid. Your choice of uh, option. Start with uh, Andrew. Well, the first thing that has me concerned is I'm not quite sure I understand that serious drainage that occurred early on and, and it just went away with removal of 
the wire. Um, it doesn't sound like infection now, but certainly I want to rule out infection. Uh, is she symptomatic at all? Does she have any erythema oh, or any? After uh, the after the removal of uh, wires, she is totally asymptomatic with regard to uh, the serious charge. An inflammatory marker has has been normal. Okay, let's presume there's no infection. Certainly cognizant of this. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, this point. is removal and RSA for me. The issue here is the exact points that everybody has made is that the greater tuberosity lack of external rotation, um, you know, if we could salvage any cuff posteriorly, uh, you know, I don't love doing proximal humeral allograft with cuff, but that may be the only way to restore any external rotation, but I would do removal, possible proximal humeral allograft with RSA. Allograft and RSA, yes, with it? With, with, with rotator cuff attached posteriorly. Yes. If, if we, I could salvage some of that cuff. If you can, if you can see some erotic cuff on the back. <laughs> yes, Anu? Or uh, I would potentially do... latis transfer as well to uh, get some external rotation because you'll be right there. Okay. Anu? Yeah, that was the last thing that I was going to add was I would probably just do the lat transfer, but I would still do an infection workup. Um, I would do uh, a frozen section um, intraoperatively. Uh, because again, I, I would be concerned about that stairs drainage. Something doesn't add up. Um, I, I agree, fixation was a problem, but why was there drainage? And it just disappeared by just taking out the wires. Uh, but this is progress. I don't know the timeline of this progression, but that would be something I'd want to rule out before I plan to perform a reverse. Yes, infection screening is very important. Sunday. Briefly. Yeah, Ram, I think we have to be a little careful now. Uh, uh, if I may be a little philosophical, when you make a mistake, the first thing you do is don't make a second mistake. <laughs> so, What is worse than an infected plating is an infected reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So uh, I would do a CT scan, check whether there is any element of GT bone uh, remaining. And uh, suppose there is some uh, GT bone still there, which means the cuff is still there, then I would uh, remove the uh, and either same stage or if there is suspicion of infection on opening, then a second stage, I would reconstruct again with a fibula graft, strut graft. And along with that, iliac cancellar graft as well and, and reconstruct this proximal humerus. Uh, presuming that the infection is under control. Yes. So it's a complex perception. We have to plan of the ruling out infection. Uh, any comment to make, Vivek? No. no. It's, uh, it's uh, Ram, uh, I think you'll have to place me before Sanjay because Sanjay seems to read my mind <laughs> all the time. I can, you can just agree. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree with him. In fact, previously, I mean, in, in the early phase, I would have gone in and done a reconstruction at that stage. And even today, I agree yes. that in our society, I would not go in for a reverse replacement right away for various reasons. Even if it doesn't get infected, the function may not be as good with everything that I can do. I would be more conservative, give him another chance of fixation, and he may have a reasonable function. And that's the end of his uh, operation the rest of his life for the shoulder. If, so I wouldn't, if, come, to, I wouldn't if he, come to reverse. Yeah, if he had uh, seen the patient at that time. But uh, yeah. the surgeon, uh, operation three, the surgeon proceeded with the hemiotoplasty for the patient. Mistake in between. <laughs> just to highlight, just to highlight that, you know, hemiotoplasty of the shoulder for trauma, uh, it's a complex operation. Uh, you know, hemiotoplasty for an arthritic condition is easier, but for arthritis, Actually, it is a, a challenging uh, surgery and you had to get it right. And even though you get it right, uh, still the GT can uh, get absorbed, resorbed, uh, can lead to poor function uh, up to 20-30%. Uh, so when there is no GT uh, tuberosity, uh, this is bound to uh, failure. Any uh, comments? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, no may I ask you a May I ask a question to Sanjay? Sanjay, you're, you're 
you're very wise and experienced, and, and, and I agree there's nothing worse than uh, an infected reverse. I guess the question I have and the reason I would consider that is I also think it's, it is worse, though, if you do do another fixation. It's great if it heals and you're done. But if that second fixation heal, doesn't heal, then you do a reverse afterwards or a resection, that reverse is going to be worse off than if you just did the right operation first. So I'm, my question to you is, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. <clears throat> so if you do a reverse as a revision of a failed fixation, and the res published results of that, versus a reverse after an attempting second fixation, there's not going to be much of a difference. Okay. In okay. terms of in terms of shoulder function, ASES or constant score. <laughs> Basically, yeah. it's, going it. it's going to be bad either way. <laughs> yes, that's, that's, that's right. But, is, but that's right. But at it least you you will have a limb hanging on your on your on your torso. Yes, yes. As basically, it's, uh, it's either primary uh, reverse or a secondary reverse uh, following a delay or surgery. One surgery, surgery sometimes doesn't make big difference. But these are the prerequisites for a trauma hemi for the uh, uh, surgeons uh, who are in the early career in shoulder elbow surgery. You need a good bone quality. There should not be any gross instability. You know, it should be intact. Rotator cuff should be there or repairable tear. So the key to success is the correct indication. Here, it is not a correct indication. And also, uh, whenever you do, is a choice of platform stem because uh, later conversion to reverse is possible. In this case, this is not a platform stem. Uh, and of course, you have to uh, allude to this height and get some uh, bone grafting uh, to reconstruct with the appropriate version. But having said that, uh, the tuberosity repair or soft tissue repair is very key. Uh, that is not possible here because it was not existing. So we have this situation. Uh, what do you expect to happen? I think we know as shoulder surgeons, we know what to expect. Uh, this is the this is the point. Uh, the patient uh, comes to me uh, with uh, uh, five years uh, down the line, having severe pain, unable to carry on activities of daily living, flexion abduction only thirty degrees, very painful shoulder, no rotations, uh, inflammatory focus have been normal. Uh, the wound, uh, the skin is also normal. So that is uh, her X-ray uh, showing a static uh, subluxed hemiotroblast. How to go about it? Sorry, Andrew. <laughs> you know, this is a very difficult conversation with any patient. You know, see where they are mentally. Honestly, I saw this suggested, but. This is a point where I would actually very much consider, you know, reaction and, and leave it alone. Um, you know, if this pain is, look, I want to keep going for it. I, I would have, I would still probably have a lot of hesitation to do that because this is a partnership and there's not a lot of here. You're asking for a very big reconstruction now after multiple failed surgery. I, I would very much consider resection at this point. Reverse is the only other option and, and, I'm, I'm hesitant to go there now after three failed surgeries. On this uh, cemented hemi as well. Okay. Uh, Sanjay? I have, <clears throat> I have dealt with exactly a similar situation, Ram. You might have seen uh, me present it on a few occasions. And yes. of course, yes. uh, a reverse uh, long stem revision, it's, it's a big undertaking. Uh, I did impaction bone grafting. I did a linear osteotomy of the humerus to remove the implant and and the patient has done well four years post surgery, but it's a big undertaking with limited goals. You need to counsel the patient. Right. So you just uh, uh, guess what I'm going to say next to slide. Anup Shah, do you do anything different? You know, I, I'm really concerned about the amount of bone loss um, yes. that has progressed. And that that's quite concerning. I think while the deltoid contour seems to be okay. Um, I'd be curious to know what is the deltoid tuberosity and what is the deltoid function after all of these surgeries um, that's happened. But, you know, I agree that it's a partnership with your patient, but depending on the level of activity and what desires are, 
Uh, I personally would not be opposed to a reverse shoulder arthroplasty if the deltoid is intact and we can, I can convince myself that there's no infection. Okay. Vivek? No, nothing. <laughs> Actually, I, for me, we do the, I would just like to say the young people out here that I am a trauma surgeon and I always do my arthroplasties with an arthroplasty surgeon who is well versed with these, especially in trauma situation. Okay. So I think that I mean, we uh, should always it, have it in a best combination to give the best results to the patient. Don't okay. venture into a thing which you don't have expertise in. Yeah. Jitendra? So we... uh, the reverse is theoretically the only option. But as it is in a young patient, two failed surgery, this case has been that my reverse will fail. So I would convince the patient that I think we remove the processes which will take away the pain to a large extent. It will still remain a dysfunctional arm, but going in for a reverse is buying too many troubles, too many ifs there. I may be very, very lucky if I can make her better than what she is and maybe worse than what she is. Yeah, uh, uh, I agree. Uh, Sanjay, you mentioned about the revision to long stem. Uh, yeah. Would you always try to go for a allograft because we don't have much allograft facility? Uh, no, sorry. Would you reconstruct the proximal uh, humerus? Uh, if the stem is relatively easy to remove, that's wonderful. Otherwise, you should be prepared to do a linear osteotomy, remove all the stent, do an impaction bone grafting, and a long stem reverse uh, is with, again, limited goals. It's, it's yes. uh, another case, but uh, I don't think time will permit yes. to so, show both so the, the, that's the thing because in multiple operations, the proximal uh, uh, anatomy is distorted. Uh, proximal humeral bone loss is there. Some posterior cuff was there, but as you see, the prosthesis is uh, quite uh, prominent under the skin. So we just did a, a vertical osteotomy of the uh, humerus, remove that uh, stem, and also uh, reaming uh, with image guidance to get past the uh, similar stricter to get uh, long stem viewers. Uh, now, uh, it, it, Aiden, uh, this was case was done years ago, and uh, I wasn't using allograft at the time much, not available much in Chennai. I just uh, relied on the long stem prosthesis alone to maintain the stability here. The post cuff is attached, uh, and the uh, internal rotation is strengthened by rerouting to the shaft. So that post-operative, as we said before, is a major undertaking. As soon as I operate the post-operative, I went and the patient. Uh, to say that uh, there were a lot of uh, scarring around the axilla, I traced the axillary nerve, released it, the circumferential scar release around the inferior of the shoulder, but uh, didn't go uh, formal exploration of the complete plexus. So she developed a weakness in elbow flexion, uh, recovered over a few days, but she developed wrist drop. Postoperatively, I had to treat with her with the brace. That's the uh, postoperative. <clears throat> Initial movement. Uh, and, uh, she didn't regain much movement. She gained movement around around uh, 70 to 90 degrees flexion abduction, but she's able to rotate the arm. She's able to, she was able to do her day-to-day -day activities with the right shoulder after five years and three years of which was spent in uh, pain. So that's just to indicate uh, she's back to function, but that is the range of internal, external rotation and flexion abduction, but she's back to her life with no pain for the last uh, two, three years now. Uh, and his radial nerve has uh, completely recovered, but she also had a neurogenic pain in the forearm, which took around six months to uh, recover. So would you formally explore the plexus in these cases? I generally do not explore the plexus in these cases. Because when you try to, uh, I might in the length, you get get and you have a praxia, which took a long time to record. You to that. No, that's that's a great point. Uh, length is, is a huge issue that can lead to nerve injury. So you have to be very cognizant about over lengthening and the tension. Um, I, I do that sort of by feel. And one actually good idea is get a contralateral full length view. You can plan for your allograft or how much lengthening you're going to do um, okay. in comparison. 
So we'll uh, we'll go to this next case. And Aram, Aram, we'll may see. I show that? May I show that case uh, if you allow? Yes, please. Yes, please. Then I will follow that with uh, this case. I, I will take just a few seconds. Yes, absolutely. Good. Uh, I think it's very important to uh, fix the fracture in the right way in the first place. Uh, so let Sanjay uh, show it his. Show, it just shows two diverse outcomes. Uh, can the host uh, permit me to share the screen? Yes, please. Let me just. Okay, done. Yes, Sanjay? Yeah. <clears throat> so, Sanjay is going to show the just unique intramedullary staple device. Can you see Ram? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Okay, so this is uh, your lady was 48. This is 45 year old road traffic accident. He had a vascular injury, as you can see on that uh, angio film. Uh, pretty bad, comminuted, four part fracture, a similar age group. And I want to show this case to highlight the diagonally opposite result you can get in similar situation. This is what I did. This is an intramedullary fixation device. It goes uh, the staple goes in the head and it engages to the stem by a more staper. And that is the functional result of this gentleman. The vascular guys did a graft uh, and he is now nearly three plus post-op and there is no avascular uh, necrosis and uh, that is his function. And those who are interested, this is published uh, just a few months ago in the journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery 2020, and that is the DOI, 30 cases with more than two years follow. Thank you, Ram. Thank you. That was a nice publication, by the way. I saw that. Uh, it's a very <laughs> interesting process. Thank you. Just uh, share. The... Okay. Uh... Did you, did you help design this, Jay, or is this a, a prosthesis that no, I haven't seen this prosthesis besides it. The original design is by Professor from France, but I'm in the process of modifying it. Excellent. So let us uh, uh, let us see one more case because uh, this is the the age younger because the muscle humor fracture occurs more commonly in the younger age group in India. It is not classically of older age group as well. So, 30 year old right hand dominant lady with this uh, fracture. So, that's her uh, CT scan. So, quick. Uh, so, that's the CT scan showing the multi fragmentary nature. And we show uh, axial CT. I, uh, I think most of you. Uh, routinely do CT for such a case. Now, let's take a poll on what is your plan of treatment here. Percutaneous, intramedullary, I think uh, Sanjay has shown a just new device, or if it's pleating, hemi, reverse. I just put that four, five, and six as a note. You don't need to necessarily choose those. Yes, uh, start with Vivek. Uh, <clears throat> here, for me, I would go in with the pleating. I'll try with the percutaneous, just lifting up the fragment because it's a valgus impacted one. I just lift to lift the humeral head and the GT to push it place. But I'll still, I, for me, a 30 year old dominant hand, I can give good results with over a plate. As much as possible reduction. Yeah. Correct? Yes. And yeah, you? sure. Yeah, I agree. Or if um, valgus impacted generally do well. Um, you know, I, I have had. I think the bone quality would be very good. I, I don't think you probably need a, a strut, but I have had very good success in these valgus impacted fractures. Once you just put a strut in there, whatever you want to use, it really holds it up. And then the fixation is, is, is gravy. Uh, the fixation, uh, the strut really helps dramatically in the reduction, but you as mentioned before, you really can't open it up, devascularize, you have to be very careful with it, but it, it has been helpful in my hands. You would, you would reduce the head fragment and use this intramedullary to support the fixation? Correct. 
it support the head and additionally help the fixation. Uh, synthetic or uh, uh, bone graft substitute or synthetic? I mean, I have used um, fibular strut in the past. Fibular strut. And that, that has worked well for me. Okay. Anu? So I, I agree. I think uh, <clears throat> a plate for a comminuted greater tuberosity fracture in conjunction with an anatomic neck fracture and valgus impaction is the way to go. I think if there was no anatomic neck fracture and if the greater tuberosity was extensively comminuted, I may consider an open uh, ORIF with uh, suture anchors um, as another alternative. But just because of the proximal humerus fracture or the, or the anatomic neck, I would uh, definitely plate this. Like this. Uh, Sanjay, would you do uh, just unique yeah. device here? Absolutely, Ram. I'm, I'm, I may, I may the add criteria, a The criteria for that is that the staple should engage the head fragment. It should have enough size. Yes, I don't see any problem in doing in this case. Yeah. But I want to add a comment that I find it extremely difficult to get consistently good result with plating in this kind of proximal humerus fractures. So my choice is just unique, yeah. Yeah, we had seen the previous X-ray as well where the fixation was done, but that's a different scenario, but it is a challenging uh, to or if as well to get an energy reduction. Jitendra? So Ram, my, my take is that key to uh, success in this case is to manage to keep that where you have reduced it. Once you get it back to position, there'll be a big hollow, free with Andrew. I will use some kind of a strut inside, not intramedullary necessarily, but that can devascularize a lot of things, but a good cortico cancellous graft from iliac crest to build up that void. If I don't do it with that small head, this is going to collapse with whatever fixation you may do. Okay. So I would, I would use a graft there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for me, as I said before, I I don't use intramedullary fibula out here, but for me, cortico cancellous grafts, iliac crest, and most of the time I use bone substitutes here. And I find in a 30-year-old, bone substitute is going to give me adequate fixation. What I require is the initial three weeks to four weeks for getting that fixation to remain in that position. And yes. then the healing process takes over. If I may ask Vivek, what is the bone substitute you're talking about? It's a calcium hydro uh, tri TCP with hydroxyapatite combination 80-20 or 60-30. Mean block. Which I'm using. Yeah, okay. blocks. Okay. It just fits in box or cones which you get and you can fix it. You just require it for the initial one. Right. The healing nature takes over dramatically. I think most of us agree to do a proper open deduction, elevate the head. Uh, I mean, you reduce the head fragment, it might be a white. Uh, in a scenario, my personal preference is not to use anything as far as the culcar is in uh, contact and the greater tuberosity is well anatomically reduced. The head is elevated, held. Uh, don't personally use a synthetic bone graft substitute in the acute fracture, but if the patient is elderly, osteoporotic, or delayed presentation, then uh, to create fill up the void, a metaphysical graft. Uh, just to show the technique here, that is a short deltopatric approach. Uh, the most important key, as mentioned by the speakers, or the uh, suture applied at the rotator cuff bone interf interface. Uh, which is here. Uh, we have the supra, infra, and uh, subscap switches. Uh, the bulbs was uh, tenotomized and tenodesist later. This is the reduction of the uh, joystick reduction of the fragment to get the call curve. Once you get that, some I might also temporarily fix into the uh, glenoid. Uh, I have here used the uh, carbon reinforced plate, uh, been using for the last two years. And uh, which has got a tremendous clarity of view during the reduction, anterior uh, AP and lateral view to check reduction, put the call curve screw, you will see the direction. It is also a polyaxial uh, uh, screw because if you fix an ankle, there is an issue with the uh, screw trajectory. So, this is the reduction, and it's very important to do this uh, dynamic screening at the end of your surgery to check. Uh, uh, please do not rely on static AP lateral images. Because that will cheat. It is a ball, uh, like a cricket ball. You get the screw short and have long screws. So, this is the uh, technique of uh, uh, internal fixation just to complete our uh, session. Ram, Ram may, I, may I make a comment for a food, yeah, for yes. thought, food for thought? Yes. So, excellent fixation. And I propose to everyone that do you agree or disagree that proximal humerus fractures which need 
internal fixation should be done by a surgeon and not by a general orthopedic surgeon except Dr. Vivek. <laughs> <laughs> You need no. to call Vivek to pitch in now. Okay. I, I, I would say that what we should be emphasizing is the proper reduction. As Dr. Maheshwari was saying that it's soft. I would say being a trauma surgeon, dealing with bones all the time, that it's a soft tissue surgery, which is more important here, that you reduce the tuberosities, bring back the rotator cuff into its place and hold the medial hinge as well as the lateral hinge. Once you are able to do that, Nature helps you always if you do it properly. We don't have to make it difficult for him to do I think the that's, things. That's the key message. Stable fixation of the cold core and the tuberosity. Tension band sutures to cuff to offload the uh, uh, tension. Optimum screw trajectory. Bone grafting if indicated on early mobilization or the key. But quite long screws and recognize the screw penetration. Check a dynamic uh, screening uh, just to finish it off. Fixed angle plate positioning, remember, dictate the screw trajectory so that you have to keep it in mind. You want to avoid impingement, you just lower the plate, then your entire trajectory gets uh, changed. So, you could consider variable angle uh, uh, screw or you could consider also a uh, uh, peak, uh, which is a new. Uh, uh, so, I think we will uh, uh, your on time 45 minutes off. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vivek. Andrew, Anup, Sanjay, Jidendra, fantastic discussion. Thank you very much. Now, just thank you. Uh, that was great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. It. Thank you, Ram. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Indo American Society and Sesi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are on time. Uh, I would request uh, Shivaraman to Umar Sri Kumaran to share the screen and take over. Great. Thank you. Uh, that was a great uh, discussion. Can you, um, is, can you guys see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. You can. Thank you. Okay, great. So uh, we'll move on now to the revision rotator cuff repair panel. We have uh, myself moderating, Dr. Singh, Dr. Babukar, Dr. Pariwala, Dr. Sundarajan, and Dr. Subramaniam as the panel, but I think uh, we have a a nice size group, so please feel free to chime in. Paul, you can feel free to co-moderate with me. I see quite a large um, Baltimore contingent on the call, Dr. Lotra, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Murthy uh, as well. Uh, so, all right, that's our first case. This is one of um, my cases. This a three-year-old, it's a white collar worker. He likes to swim. So he has a, some right shoulder recurrent pain with the overhead activity, He's four out of five weakness uh, in forward elevation as well as external rotation. He's had two prior rotator cuff repairs, one in 1989 and uh, back in 2014. So that's his background. Just to start with a, a couple images. Anju, you want to review the imaging for us and how you look at MRIs in this revision setting? Yeah, sure. I, I think um, I think the uh, coronal and um, sacral views here, you can see the supraspinatus is retracted to the level of the head on the coronal and the uh, and on the sagittal, which um, you, you can kind of judge the level of retraction, I think, as you go uh, more medially um, you can judge the muscle quality. I mean, from these views, because you actually see fairly medially, um, even though, um, uh, you, you know, you can see the muscle quality is actually pretty good for someone that's had uh, this much surgery in the past. I'd like to search to the subscat. There you go. Was this first surgery uh, open? It was 1989. Uh, yeah, first surgery was open. Second one was actually arthroscopic. That yeah. change anything for you? Um, no, not really. I think every now and again, you know, I usually do everything arthroscopically. If someone had a good experience open, I sometimes offer them open for their other side. Um, but uh, not not really. I think, uh, yeah, so this looks like at least a two tendon tear, superior cuff, uh, it retracted to the level of the top of the humeral head. It, the muscle quality actually looks surprisingly good. 
And it looks like, you know, he has some old anchor tracks and great velocity, but it looks like his bone quality also is probably okay. We probably can judge that better on other on x-rays and stuff like that too. Okay, a couple other slices. Um, yeah, the x-ray is some mild arthritis, but uh, it's pretty well maintained joint space. Dr. Uh, Pradiwa, any, any thoughts here? How you would approach this? Sorry. So I think what I'm looking for in the X-ray and the MRI is the acromiumeral distance and whether there's any cuff tear arthropathy. Both of those seem to be okay, number one. On the MR, the two things that I'm looking for are secondary fatty degeneration, the muscle, that's not there. Whether there's any tendon atrophy, do we really have a tendon that we can repair? And again, we can see in this case that we don't have a significant amount of uh, muscle atrophy. We've also got a tendon there that's not significantly retracted, which we can repair. So from management point of view, I'm thinking of a revision cuff repair in this situation, but I'd also like to see the subscap and see what was done for the biceps, whether those are pain generators, whether you know ultimately we will have that transverse force couple uh, repaired. Uh, but for me, when I see this, if this is uh, symptomatic, he's relatively young, he's a swimmer, he wants overhead strength. Uh, for me, this would be a case that I would offer uh, a revision repair. Okay. So, Dr. Babukar, how would you uh, approach this, counsel this patient uh, with your options? Right. Uh, Uma, um, number one, I think... I agree that this is highly reparable and could be operated. We need to look at patient's requirements and the understanding of uh, whether he wishes and what are his goals. Um, I'm a little concerned. I don't see any anchor holes there or I don't see any uh, with two shoulder surgeries done. Um, yeah, uh, this one does show the lateral and anchor. So the bone quality looks good. It's eminently fixable. If it's fit and well, we should. I might consider augmenting my repair with a dermal graft, if at all, but I'll keep that in the back table. Okay. Dr. Sundarajan, any uh, other thoughts? How would you approach this differently than a primary repair? Yeah, uh, okay. Dr. Uma, I mean, I want to know whether the, what is the disability for the patient? Is the pain or the function? I think the... He's a lot of pain, but he's also weak. He likes to swim. He's having trouble swimming. Okay. So because he has already underwent two studies with a with big span of years, I mean, uh, probably 15 years gap, and also the that doesn't look to be an acute one. So it's a chronic one. He was living with this for a long time. So I don't know when it happened. The second surgery failed also. We are not sure enough. He having this problem for quite a long time. Maybe the in the later years, he developed the pain. In my opinion, I mean, if it, because uh, definitely as uh, Ashish and Dinsa said that cuff is repairable, surprisingly, the quality of the cuff is very good. Really. And uh, of course, he, uh, I don't know, the, over the year, maybe the muscle wasting also could be the reason for the weakness. I want to know whether did he undergo a good uh, rehabilitation before you advise for this uh, revision surgery. Dr. Subramaniam, uh, what, what is your approach? So, you know, uh, this patient had two surgeries, one in 2014, and uh, uh, he has been symptom free for a while, and only in the last few months he's been having pain. <coughs> um, if he has had rehab already and then uh, mm -hmm. for surgery, I think his muscle is having had two surgeries, not that bad right now. It looks reasonably good, has not much fatty atrophy there, and uh, graded tuberosity bone stock looks reasonably good also. So in that kind of setting, uh, if he's symptomatic, then you should consider for uh, uh, doing a revision repair. I think it is repairable, uh, but you might have to do slightly medialized repair. It should be repairable. Uh, I don't have much experience on tendon transfers and all. I think uh, results may not be that good, for, but at least for this one, I'll try for medial, medialized repair at least, if possible. Uma, can I just yeah. ask a question? Um, yeah. How has he torn his head cuff twice? Has it been acute trauma or is it a degenerative repetitive injury? Uh, the first uh, 2014 was a, was a trauma, but this one, this, he just started having pain. So no, no known trauma. So I would like to get a cervical screen because if there's a C5, C6 lesion there, then 
that might be uh, it's just one of those things but it's happening again it's very unusual mm-hmm. to have a you know a rotator cuff the same lightning usually doesn't strike twice yeah i, I would like to just put a comment dr subramaniam i think made a really great point when i was a resident you know there were a lot of papers looking at during open cuff repairs about over tensioning the cuff and how much you can medialize and medializing was really in vogue for open cuff repairs. And now that we've gone to majority arthroscopic, I feel like we're really obsessed with restoring the anatomic footprint. And in cases like this, in massive cases, I will take two, four, six millimeters of the uh, uh, off the edge of the uh, articular surface there just to get a better footprint for healing. And I think that's a little bit fallen out of favor, but um, we don't talk about tension enough, in my opinion. And I think that's a, it is a factor of healing that we don't consider that much. Yeah, I think that's a great point. What what specific technical factors would you do different with this revision repair? It seems like we all can agree the muscle looks pretty good. It looks like another type one tear. Your tendon length is good. It looks like we'd be able to fix this. How would you approach this differently is, uh, from a technical standpoint? Are you still, we talked a little bit about the medialization. Are we doing single row? Or are we still using anchors? Are we going to add the graft? What biologics uh, are we going to consider? You know, Personally, start. I'll go in there, I'll put a trap suture in there, and I'll systematically release, uh, you know, from lateral to medial, first on the upper side of the of the tendon, releasing it from the acromion, then the underside. Of course, you have to be a little careful as you get close to the notch for the suprascapular nerve. Do an anterior interval slide. Posterior interval slide, I tend to not do very often. And then I'll kind of do what, what it gives me at that point. I'll medialize the tuberosity if needed. If I can get a double repair, great. If not, you know, maybe single row. And in that case, I might consider augmenting it with some kind of graft, either a dermal allograft or a regenitin patch or something like that. If, if I feel like I'm not getting a really good mechanical fixation. Because I think his biology looks reasonable, even though he's failed twice. It surprisingly, it looks quite yeah. good. Dr. Pariwala, any special things you would add in the revision setting to this next uh, repair? I think what I really want to make sure is at the end of the day, it's a low tension repair. I think if he's failing, he's failing primarily because of the tension there. He's got a good tendon. We don't really need to cover the entire footprint. I think it's important just to make sure that you've got a good stable fixation with the low tension repair. I don't think this is a case where we need to medialize it too much because we can see the tendon quality seems to be fairly good. It's not retracted. Uh, multiple points of fixation on the needle aspect of the footprint, and that should be, I think, adequate. The trick here also is to avoid the previous anchors. So if necessary, uh, make sure that you know where exactly those anchors are, what sort of anchors were used. Uh, They're certainly not metallic anchors, so that helps. I don't try and remove the anchors because that creates a void in the bone. Just try and prevent uh, using the area where those previous anchors have gone. This is not a case where I use uh, all suture anchors because you'd have a break in the uh, superficial plate there. So I'd use a standard uh, uh, anchor that would go straight in and get probably the best hold in subconder bone. Okay. So I think those are great points. I mean, I, I took a, a revision approach with a, a transosseous technique. Uh, this is, Butch couldn't be here. So I think someone had to talk about the uh, transosseous uh, approach on, on his behalf. But I think it does offer some advantages, uh, particularly in the revision uh, setting. Uh, particularly to avoid the prior anchors. If there was a lot of them in there, you start losing your bony um, bone stock uh, footprint availability for other anchors. At least this was peak, so you can still kind of get around that um, with the transosseous technique. And as you mentioned, multiple fixation points, you get a lot of features in there with the uh, transosseous approach, a good footprint compression, you can medialize uh, as desired. And the failure mechanism has also been shown to be better. If it's going to fail again, it'll be a type one versus a type two uh, repair you might see in a double row approach. Um, the bio- biology considerations in terms of having venting into your bone marrow and uh, for us, some of the cost saving considerations. So those are, we saw as the primary advantages for um, this sort of uh, approach with uh, transosseous. Dr. Uh, Sundaranjan, any other uh, technical tips in this, uh, like these cuff releases, what kind of releases do you have to do uh, for a revision setting or how do you approach that for mobilization? Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, in this case, I don't think we need to do 
so much mobilization because the retraction is not too far. Uh, but in really in um, other cases, uh, we may need to end up uh, at least in the both the green level and also the acromion level. And um, and most often we may need to do sometimes uh, at least, but posterior release I always try to avoid. So we try to do um, uh, both scatulation in the spine of the scapula and also at the gluteal level or most around uh, at least or one centimeter level, so that we can get enough mobilization. And most of the time we should be able to do the repair. If it's not possible, at least I would get a more of infraspinal test to do a get back. It is always easy to do a more most posterior medial release. that helps you helps you to mobilize the infraspinatus so i should be able to repair infraspinatus most of the time ashish um i think that looks calf it almost like a primary calf repair i would just add tapes to reduce the uh, type to fail and uh, the single row or double row depends on the tension that i see in trop so it's not a pre op decision for me uh, but this looks like a great because the cuff quality looks incredibly good i think the transesius uh, repair is a very good technique in uh, revision situations maybe in this case uh, even st- we, we we should be able to come or uh, like uh, what dinsa said with all insects uh, suture anchors but still i feel the bone quality is very good uh, mm-hmm. we can add with some simple stitches even the rip stop uh, with the suture tape in this case uh, uh, um Yes, sir. Ram here. Yes, Ram. Okay, go ahead. Uh, just, just the uh, question regarding is a great technique. The revision scenario. How do you adjust the uh, location of the uh, anchor? So, if you are using a single or double row anchor, we use the anchor location to adjust to the tension. But here we cannot change the tunnel. So, how do you go about getting the correct tension with the transosseous technique for a medialized cuff? Yeah, that's a good question. I think. Um... where the tunnels the medial tunnels where they exit are very similar to where you might put the medial row of anchors so it's really where you pass your stitches through the tendon that will uh, determine your your tension so you'll get that circumferential thing when you uh, tie your sutures um, through the tunnel and around the tendon so tension is almost wholly determined by uh, and the medialization by where you pass the suture through the tendon. So obviously you don't want to take a tremendous medial bite of tendon and yes. over over tension it, but no, uh, it's still quite uh, tensionable uh, through this technique. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, but can you speak a little bit to uh I mean I know it's not the purpose of this, but your experience with um this uh transosseous technique and like in what cases you use it? Yeah, no, I like this technique. Uh, I mean, I use anchors too, and you know, we have a fellowship program. We always teach the fellows anchors first because I do think it's a little bit easier. But it's very similar in technique, as you can see. You know, you place the same awl that you would use anchor. Um, so I think when costs drive it more, it would be a preferred approach all the time. Uh, it, it does require you know good bone, but I think the suture cutout is what most people are concerned about when when you uh, demonstrate this technique, but it's really sort of an over considered you know risk. Uh, it's just common for me to have an anchor pull out of poor bone uh, as it is to have a suture cut through you know poor bone. So you have to take the same considerations for you know poor uh, bone quality, whether it's an anchor or a suture. It's kind of nice to have both techniques. Uh, I, if I have trouble with the transosseous, you can fall back on anchors or vice versa. Both. Um, I don't use any one exclusively. I do like it in the revision settings and in bigger tears. Um, it's actually a little bit easier to use when that full tuberosity is exposed. Um, so those kinds of situations. But it, it lends itself to all the other techniques we use. You know, retrograde or anterograde suture passing. It, um, it's a little bit more suture management but other than that uh it's good it's great for mris afterwards it doesn't uh you know ruin the uh, mri image and the bone foot and the bone stock remains which are sort of the main advantages ma i think yeah. this bone quality is uh, reasonably good isn't it yeah it's very good not very good would you still use a transosseous technique or would you go for anchor technique Yeah, so I would test uh, the medial row. So when there's some bone quality issues, it's more important to get very low on the tuberosity. So down 
down here, the, the bone density becomes much uh, greater as you go more inferior along uh, the lateral text. So you can get into very dense bone and have a good bridge. Um, and then uh, another, as she's mentioned, I use tapes. That'll also protect your tunnel and make it less likely to cut out. And the direction of where you push the knot, if you go along the lateral row, is also protective um, of uh, your cutout. Uh, what about the biologic? So in a revision setting, does anybody use bone marrow aspirate or use any of those retin graphs automatically? Or what's the decision making? You use bone marrow or? Not really. Uh, we don't have regenitin in India as yet. It's a uh, bovine uh, zero graft. And I think that's going to have some concerns uh, of it coming into India. Uh, but I don't regularly use any sort of biologics. I think when you make uh, puncture holes in the bone for your anchors, and when these are you know fluted anchors, you're going to have some amount of that marrow come out of that greater tuberosity under the cuff. And that's the area where it really needs to heal. If I've got uh, good bone stock and I, I'm doing, say, a uh, double row sort of repair, that makes a, a small microfracture puncture holes in the great fibrosity again, just to get that uh, bone marrow out there. But I don't inject any BMAC, or any PRP or anything uh, further uh, during the procedure. So does anyone else do that micro channeling or that crimson duvet type thing? Ashish? Well, um, we flirted with the crimson duvet and then uh, we kind of gave up. But when it looked dodgy, difficult cases, revision, we just do some microfracture on the greater tuberosity footprint. Uh, but nothing substantial, certainly no other specific biologicals. I, I have used uh, autologous condition serum in a couple of cases and one and, and few PRPs, but really just one only. I don't know if it really adds up much benefit in uh, healing wise. The outcome was not very different. It was a good outcome only in those patients. Okay. Now this first case, we had good quality tendon, good bone. So another, another uh, we thought was appropriate and um, he's done reasonably well with uh, with the third rotator cuff repair. Ashish, this is your case. Um, I can click through if you want to take us through it. Yeah, sure. I, li I like your uh, caution right there. I, think I need that every time before I speak. Mask and that's for every rotator cuff. <laughs> it's never the same. So um, this is a 49-year-old lady. Um, we did our uh, left cuff repair back in October 2018, and uh, that went well. Touch wood, uh, she's doing fine. Uh, she had some spine surgery after that, and she had an accident just during the COVID period, uh, just before the COVID period and was immobilized at home. And uh, years back, correction there, it, uh, she's had a right uh, cuff repair elsewhere previously, and uh, she was concerned about it. It was known that it was a re-tear and large, and she should have come in 2019 to get it repaired, uh, the revision. But uh, because of her uh, couple of other surgeries for the spine and leg, uh, it went untreated, and then because of COVID, she missed out on most of last year, and then came back um, six weeks back, and uh, she had incredible pain on the right shoulder and complete dysfunction. So she was not quite a drop arm, but infections were just 90, 70. The rotator cuff strength was very weak, and uh, we were wondering what to offer. Can you take us to the next slide, Uma? So this is the status of the right side. You can see distinct proximal migration and uh, large uh, subscap tear, metal implants. So this surgeon was using titanium anchors then. This is back in 2010. And uh, so any thoughts on this? So this is the imaging. This is what you have. Uh, Sundar, I think you have your opinion. Yeah. It's, uh, I, th I think already there are a lot of superior migration. I can I could see that uh, almost is touching the acromion, but I, I don't know whether the X-ray shows any arthritic changes over there. Well, uh, nothing. No arthritis. No arthritis. I think subscap uh, subscap is also up to the glenoid level. Uh, is it yeah. so? Yeah. Subscap is um, a type four tear. Uh, yeah. 
And more stuff. worrying was the amount of wasting of the substance, a lot of, of fat. Fat, yes. I could see the fatty degeneration over yeah. there. And also the superinfrared reductions, uh, the three tendon tear, yeah. the tractor almost up to the glen eye level, maybe slightly more than that. Uh, so because he's only female, uh, still, uh, I think uh, if the subscap is repairable, then still he should go ahead for revision repair. But however, considering the uh, female patient, even the functional wise, the forward elevation is not very good. Uh, we don't know the prognosis can be explained. We should have a attempt to do it, but the, because only the superior migration is only for me because it is too high. Yes. But still, it's so worth uh, the cuff quality. Even the like fat infiltration in the supra and infra is, I don't think it's more than uh, two or three. So I think still we can do a, a sustainable uh, release on the, the three tendon releases. Uh, we can try to do a, if the subscap is repairable, able to do a retain the force couple by repairing infra spinatus. And I won't do any SCR uh, retendant transfers. Right. Anshu, how about you? Yeah, I would agree. Um, I'm just trying to orient myself. That the the subscap is the one that's totally uh, degenerated, correct? Uh, yes. On the, uh, yes. Yes. The supra infra look good. Yeah, I mean, if you're catching her right before she develops degenerative changes, and you can see that she actually doesn't have migration on the MRI as much as the X-ray, so she still yes. is in the dynamic phase before she uh, develops uh, contracture uh, and has a fixed. Um, uh, sort of uh, superior subluxation. So I would actually consider, you know, if, if depending on her sort of atrophy and, and her willing to do the, the, the rehab, I, I think about a lap transfer uh, for subscap. You know, I would, I would consider in, in this patient. Yeah. Okay. Uma? I, I agree with uh, Andrew. I would, for the, for the subscap, I think the let this transfer is excellent. Um, I would definitely probably approach this uh, just as an open case for that reason and repair whatever uh, remaining cuff primarily that I could to remove the the uh, metal anchors and uh, address the biceps tendon. Of course, he's had a pretty aggressive acromioplasty already. Yes. Um, I wouldn't do anything there. Maybe you would add some dermal allograft to the you know anterior superior area. Of, Sure. As a primary approach. And uh, prognosis wise? So, Dinsha, can we have play this uh, diagnostic sure. video? So, here? First, okay, so, the first thing I have to do is do a traction x ray and see whether the superior humeral migration is correctable. Is this a fixed, uh, you know, so the acromiumeral distance is significant? Reduced. Now the question is whether this is fixed or where I can actually get this risk down. If action X-ray reduce it, the next is going to. Sub uh, if I can repair the sub arthroscopically, if I can do a uh, repair for that sub scap, I know there's a concern for the fatty de degeneration there. But if I can repair that, this for me would be a good indication reconstruction. So I think these would be the two prerequisites. One is, can I get my transverse force couple intact after the procedure? And can I use it? Then I would do an SCR for this. Uh, right. She's too young for uh, uh, you know a reverse. I think if this patient was older, right away, this patient is going to be candidate for a straightforward uh, reverse. She's too young for that. So if you're trying to uh, reconstruct this, it's going to be critical. If you can't get the subscap, you can't do the SCR. If you can do the subscap, but you can't get a prox you can't uh, get the humerus down, then I'd do just a subscap repair, a partial repair, and leave it at that. Right. So between a Vincha, between the lower trapezius transfer, lat dorsi, and SCR, since the indication is pretty similar, how do you choose which? Okay, so I think, uh, you know, when you, you primarily need to, I think, see what is the issue with the patient. Is it really pain? Is it range? Or is it really weakness? And I think that the tendon transfer helped tremendously as far as increasing strength is concerned. But if a patient yeah. is pseudo parallel uh, range coming in, I think there's going to be a limitation of a tendon transfer in those scenarios. I, okay. I suspect from your 
from what you showed in the active range that patient had, that was not too bad, right? The, the, the lady could bring her shoulder up to shoulder le uh, yeah. level. So in these have scenarios, a yeah. but I think in these scenarios, a tendon front is not a bad option. It's not a bad option because uh, this will only add to her strength and hopefully then uh, give her some amount of hmm. Sure. Subra? Actually, there is one positive yes. point for this patient, actually. Uh, subscap is really badly damaged, but that is a main decision. Arthroscopy, if you repair the subscap, I, I can try and do that also. And partial repair in the sense, uh, try to establish a couple. Uh, Transfers couple can be uh, That will be the line of option for me. Uh, or the other option will be to go externally. Even it also is not uh, that, that we expect. So we have to explain cautiously to the patient that uh, uh, what they are going to perform is not going to get the person outcome to that. We have to counsel the patient. That is very important in this particular patient. Yes, I agree. Um, the challenge is the duration. At these metal anchors, and it turned out that this was a proud anchor. So that's going to be a factor because it's just going to let the cuff sit down perfectly on the footprint. Um, there are many ways to skin a cat, but we keep a lot of these uh, um, insertion handles of different anchors uh, from the last 10 years. And luckily, we had them on hand. And uh, it was on hand. We could just uh, manage to remove this. Uh, Otherwise, it was a. Everything was factored on the subscap because if it was doable, then everything was going to work in. Whether we do a partial cuff repair or SCR, we consented her for everything. Uh, if the predominantly the supra infra are good, then I'm going to err towards the SCR. And if it was not good, then I would probably go for a lower trap transfer, is how I. But um, we went in, we had a really good biceps which was still intact and uh, having removed the metal anchor, I thought uh, we should do a biceps tenodesis uh, because reverse biceps tenodesis, the biceps SCR because this will protect our, our repair. The supra infra were not in good condition, they were pretty frayed, they were amenable to repair, we did extensive release. I don't do interval releases or slides. I to do a below and above the cuff, so it's stuck to the labrum and the CLE gun areas where the cuff you carved down. So we tried to, um, to uh, the entire cuff got a visible tension there. Just and those are, those are the final repair, reasonable repair, anatomical. It was. Uh, without tension, so two medial rows, two lateral rows, and uh, an amazing so subscap repair. This just the one take home from my side. I went back and looked into a, a lot of these massive subscaps, and I can explain why a supra fatty infiltration. I can't explain a subscap under was such severe fat, but we have a experience of these, and even if they incredibly tight um, to do and they've all come back and they have uh, recovered their atrophy as well. So subscap is not like infra and supra where the atrophy is uh, all pervading and would not pick up again. So once the subscap got repaired, we are we are in play and we decided this and the biceps tendon, we put a lot of faith in the biceps uh, to help protect the repair for the first six to weeks at least. Uh, next final slide. So party. Doctor, yes, Doctor Shish, it's Paul. Uh, Paul asking. Hi. This is fantastic, and I, I, I learned this this long head biceps transfer from you guys uh, when visiting. Yeah. Are you releasing the biceps distally, or are you keeping it intact entirely? Um, occasional case, I would leave it intact, but my uh, effort is to remove it. I want some biceps pain or clamping later? On. We change that. When I do a bicep SR, I reroute it to the center of the head of humerus. Yeah, I'm going to um, tension 
Uh, there's no point doing the bicep fascia in the anterior group behind the biceps group. It has to come back into the center of the greater two. I usually cut it, but on an occasion when I feel it's free and uh, no much tension, I would leave it alone. So I don't have a perfect hand. Thank you. But this is an interesting paper from Rami Eshar, and they found that the biceps SCR was much stronger, required larger uh, fold to uh, destabilize that construct, uh, even in comparison with a uh, SCR. So whether it's better than a SCR, I don't know. But it, next slide, please, Uma. It's a lot of value because uh, it is cheap, it is available, it uh, saves us a graft and possible. Then for all my massive tears, even if they are available, I would use this rather than cut off the bicep for conventional tenodysis on this. Thank you. Do you still do it if a significant slap tear? Yes, irrespective. In this population age, I ignore the slap anyway because it's likely to be degenerate. Okay. All right, let's move on to our case. Anchi. Oh, hey, okay. Um, yep, yeah, so this is a patient of mine, uh, 66 year, years old. He owns a plumbing company. He used to be a plumber and a laborer. Currently, he basically serves golfs and, and directs people as to what to do. He had an open shoulder stabilization. I think it was a capsular uh, reefing type of procedure in the 1970s when he was a young man. Then he had an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair um, by one of my partners. And per the note, he had significant atrophy of the supraspinatus. Uh, next slide, I think. Uh, so this is after that, uh, sorry, this is, um, this is after that, uh, the repair. This is when the patient came to me after he'd failed that repair. Um, anybody like to comment on that? I'm going to go for it. So it looks like he's got... Like two, there's two or three slides with pics on there. Sure. So, yeah, that significant uh, high-riding humeral head here, uh, narrow distance, retracted <coughs> supraspinatus, significant fatty infiltration, supraspinatus, and most of his infraspinatus. His subs looks okay. Can't tell if that his biceps yeah. is still there or not. Has some osteochondral defects, it looks like, and his some of his lower uh, uh, looks intact. So, um, six year old gentleman, right? Sixty six year old. Uh, anyone want to comment before I get into? What I did that was me. Yeah. How's his external rotation? knowing that he's had a capsular so, type of... So his, he had nearly full range of motion, but he was weak, both in external rotation and in... Deltoids were really, really robust because he's in the walk day. And actually really well compensated. Um, he's a little bit of weakness overhead, like four out of five on both. Oh. What would you do, Ashish, in this case? Uh, see, my biggest concern is the supra waiting, and it's huge. It's that tangent sign is positive. And so you're clutching at straws probably there. Um, he's somewhere there, 66, and he's a sport guy. So, and with that proxon migration, the two things I can't tell on an MRI is, is that quality good? Will it take the bites? And is it elastic? Will it, if it's retracted, is it going to come back? Sometimes you have a fibrotic cuff and it just refuses to come down. And so I don't want a tension repair. The osteochondral lesion is reasonably okay. So number one, um, Attempt to what if I tell you this cuff is really, really bad? You do all the races and it's 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 uh it's awful. It's awful. So probably a good guy for an SCR um on this case. Um the fair guy uh, wants to pursue his sports. Uh, the cartilage lesion is going to be progressive as such. Uh, but I'll still give it a go, have uh, see the releases, how it works out. If I can medialize up to one centimeter. And if that's going to do a tensionless pair, then still, yes, that would be primary on my agenda. Otherwise, <laughs> an SCR. Yeah, yeah, so what's his range? What's his range of motion? So he, I mean, preoperatively, he had nearly full range of motion. His main complaint was pain and weakness no, with paddling no and surfing. And no lag signs at the side? No. Okay. Yeah. I think I would do a reverse. 
with that osteochondral defect. I'd be concerned about that and any like an SCR or another tear tighten his, his joint and increase his joint reaction force to advance this and not help him with his pain would be my concern. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my, uh, sorry. Uh, Anika, does he have more pain or is uh, his complaint is functional loss? Or mostly strength? pain is his main complaint. Pain is his main complaint. Okay. Pain with activity, not rest, pain, no crepes, that kind of thing. So I, I, you, know, you can go Uma, to the next slide. So I... You know, I scoped him, same thing. I tried to do repair, I did all the uh, releases. I think there's one before that's showing you his his cuff is like way medial to the glenoid. You can see here on the upper left side, there's no ch chance here. So uh, I took out what I could. I did an SCR, almost five year follow-up now. You can see, Uma, next slide, uh, you know, so that's kind of the SCR slide. And this is one of my, I think probably the 10th one I did. This is 2017. So you can see on the medial side, I did kind of just a tumor technique, which, you know, now most of it, I did uh, interval sort of repair front and back. I think somebody else made the point that if it's a very posterior tear, they tend to not do SCR. I agree. I think one of the reasons is that, you know, if the infraspinatus, if you can attach it to the graft, it'll tension the graft a little bit, maybe give you a little bit of tenodesis effect. So I came out of this case feeling pretty good. Um, good. Next slide. I'm going to show you guys all my not good results. Which graft, uh, which graft is this? This is this is the thick um, the dermal allograft. Did you include so, biceps uh, augmentation too, or and biceps, I think my, my partner had Tina Dees the biceps. It was gone already. Um, so now he's four years out. He came to my clinic uh, recently. He's now seventy years old. He's still able to surf, not very well. He swims almost every day. He has a pool in his yard, and he golf's. Um, still has four out of ten pain, sort of cuff pain, right seat pain over here. No problems with daily activities, but again, kind of similar to what my procedure. Motion's a little bit less than his index procedure. No lag signs, but you know weakness. And then, kind of after you know after he's in the water for 20, 30 minutes, you know it starts to hurt and he has to stop. So I think Uma was, you know. So I'll show you MRI now what it looks like. The interesting thing is I did I thought I did a relatively poor job on the glenoid fixation, but it looks like the SCR actually healed to the glenoid, but it failed on the, on the humeral, humeral side. Um, and now he does have proximal migration uh, on the MRI on x-ray as well. And so this is a failed SCR, you know. Um, Uma had a crystal ball and somehow he figured, figured out what he looked like four years later. So... So I did offer him now a reverse. Um, I think that would be the end of his days as a, as a sports athlete. So, you know, he's kind of deciding now what to do. Um, you know, we, I put him on a deltoid rotation protocol and, and that kind of thing. You know, I, I don't know if, if I wasn't doing that much lower trap back then. This was 2016, 17. I think maybe I would have considered, considered that as well. But uh, I don't know. I think it's a good point of discussion for you guys. For when would you consider lower trap SCR? Um, and those kinds of things. And, and uh, Andrew, what you, what, what, Andrew, it's Paul. Can you comment on, you, you have a study about looking at SCR failures and medial versus lateral failures. I think you and Rafi, right? Can you comment a little on that? And as right before you get into the, the discussion. Sure, of course, SCR, yeah. So we did an MRI. Yeah. We did an MRI follow-up study on our SCRs. We published it in AJSM a couple of years ago. We had something like 50 patients that were at least, I want to say two years after SCR, we got MRIs on all of them. And then we correlated the MRI findings of the graft to their um, patient reported outcomes. And basically we found that uh, if they had graft intact to the top of the head, they had a good outcome. In fact, it was the same as if they had graft on both sides. It really heals to, on the humeral side or it heals on both sides. You have a fairly good outcome. If it, if it fails on the humeral side, like my patients did, the outcome is not as good in terms of their uh, ASCS scores and, and pain scores. So I think that, you know, all of us kind of wonder why does this surgery work? It seems like it works most of the time. Um, and we are proposing that it maybe it's more of just of a, of a tuberoplasty effect that you're sort of covering the top of the humerus, not that it's a, it's a dynamic maybe structure all the time. Go ahead. Sorry. In your, uh, in your case, and also the series which you have analyzed, have you analyzed the case which you could be able to do a partial infraspinatus repair and with the side-to-side -side repair and uh, just doing one day SCR? Uh, no. So, I mean, I think our technique was consistent. There was a, a, basically three surgeons that did most of the series, and all of us will repair the, 
the uh, remnant of the infra to the dermal allograft, but we did not, I think if I, we just looked at ones without SCR, we didn't look at that. Now, referring to the tuberosity, whatever possible infra spinous tendon oh. which you could bring able to attach to the spring. Yeah, I think I think that the tech that we use, since we're all kind of in the same group and we talk a lot, we actually repair as much as we can before doing the SCR, and then we retension usually infraspinatus over the graft, and then we put uh, some sutures in that interval as well. So that was the technique that we used, but we didn't look at the ones that we were able to get more versus not. Basically, you're asking is infra critical for the outcome? My sense is yes, but I don't. I can't answer that uh, with any certainty. Okay, I think we're coming to the end here of our rotator cuff session. Thanks everyone for uh, cases and discussion points. That was excellent. And uh, I think we will move on to. Thank you. Great job. Share. Awesome. Thank you all. That was great. I, can I share my screen? Yes, please. Thank you. Can you see that all right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. And uh, once again, a great initiative on behalf of all three societies. I uh, welcome my analysts, uh, Nikhil Verma, Deep Virk, IPS Oberoi, Vivek Pandey, and Karthik Selvaraj uh, for this session. Um, are all of uh, the panelists uh, logged in? Uh, I think uh, we are getting to yep. see IPS Oberoi. Okay. IPS over IPS is here. Karthik. Okay, you can you can start uh, pick. We are uh, many many surgeons are here. Uh, Nikhil Mandi, are you with us? Yeah. Can you can you guys hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Mandi. What about Nikhil? Would oh, like to yeah. join as a panelist? I am joined. Oh, and there's Nick. Even better. Great. Yeah, so Paul, please join uh, yes. in this session. So based on the goals, uh, we've just decided to go through a few cases. So this uh, is a first time uh, shoulder dislocator, male 21, right hand dominant, uh, was uh, seen by a local orthopedic uh, person and presented uh, six weeks later to my clinic. He had dislocated this uh, playing badminton. Uh, uh, you know, an initial period of immobilization for a couple of uh, weeks and then uh, physiotherapy to get his range back. So when I examined him, the full range of motion, uh, importantly, he had a, a, a positive uh, apprehension in the end range and also a positive relocation test. Now, my uh, question uh, to uh, Vivek, are you with me? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Great. Hi. So... Um, is it possible for uh, the surgeon to determine uh, as to get a clue to where the lesion is soft tissue or bone depending on the position of apprehension or symptomatic instability? I think, um, a few years back, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about this range instability. You know, patients becoming very apprehensive, you know, somewhere around 45 to 90. Um, but I, in my clinical practice, I mean, is, and they have large bony regions, but in my clinical practice, I have failed to, you know, really correlate with this. I have found that um, there are a lot of patients who are almost 20%, uh, you know, bone loss. They have a 20% bone loss, but they don't have any mid-range instability. They are almost unstable at the end. And some of them who were actually very, very unstable, they had reverse hagel lesion along with the anterior lesion. So I personally have failed to establish this, you know, correlation. You know. Okay. Yeah, if somebody is very unstable, it can only say that there could be extensive lesion, maybe both bone and soft tissue, but definitely not only one. Okay. Uh, what about you, Mandeep? Yeah, so I think I agree. Uh, typically, if you have a critical so-called bone loss on the glenoid side, let's say 20, 25%, it's more likely that you will have apprehension at low abduction angles or a dislocation history in sleep. If you have a subcritical loss on the glenoid side, more so like 5%, 2%, your pathology is gonna be end range engagement, which means that patient is not gonna be apprehensive in uh, mid ranges. Having said that, you know, it's not just an isolated bone lesion that uh, goes into account patient's laxity. 
the soft tissue instability, like uh, one uh, our colleague mentioned, reverse haggle. So I think soft tissue and extent of soft tissue lesions can also affect that. But I would say that mid-range with uh, glenoid bone loss more than 20, 25% should be there. Nikhil, would you agree? Yeah, I think I agree with everything that's been said. The one caveat that I would add is I think in the primary situation, it would be fairly unusual for me to um, uh, see a patient that has persistent instability after the initial recovery time. That would certainly make me a little bit concerned about either a bony bank heart lesion or a Hagel lesion. Um, and then as we move to the chronic recurrent instability situation, and I think most commonly when you see patients with significant uh, apprehension, particularly as we've already talked about in mid-range positions, you, you worry more about uh, more significant pathology. Correct. So I agree with my colleagues. The purpose of bringing this uh, point up was to just make that whether it's acute or chronic, you know, how accurate can we assess whether it's going to be a soft tissue or bony lesion without imaging. So what the literature really says is that if you get it before the 60 degree mark, then really you're looking at an extensive labral tear or an attritional type of bone loss and an insufficient glenohumeral complex. Mid range is uh, bone loss, uh, as we just heard. And obviously the end range, we are probably expecting uh, purely a soft pathology, especially in the, uh, in the early dislocator. Now, uh, uh, Shreyas, to, yes. Yes, can I just ask uh, Nick? Nick, do you, I mean, do you really agree with this, you know, this mid-range instability bone loss? Because I have never been able to really demonstrate. And what is that, you know, range when you actually get this, you know, apprehension sign or let's say, you know, patient will just not allow you to do and you can be sure then, okay, it's about 20% loss or 15% loss. Does that really correlate? Because EG toy, you know, emphasized this on a lot few years back, but I don't see much emphasis of late except in typical discussions. Yeah, look, at the end of the day, none of us use our clinical exam and position of instability to make these types of diagnoses in terms of a bone loss and, and the actual level of it. I think that uh, um, for many patients, once they've had recurrent instabilities, frankly, they just know the position they can't get their arm into because of the vulnerability. And as you know, the location of the hill sacs may play a role in terms of what position of the arm can create engagement. Um, I think what's more important is understanding that when you have patients that are having low levels of instability, meaning they're reaching out to the side, they're reaching behind them in the car, they have instability at night. That tells you that the degree of pathology, whether it's less commonly capsular, more commonly bone, should warrant you to at least be alert to the status of those structures in the preoperative setting for appropriate decision-making. Yeah, Dr. Vivek, I think I want to just pull out what Nick said there, because what you're saying is that it's hard to elicit it uh, on your exam, but for me, exactly what Nick said, elicit on the history. They've rolled over and fallen out in their sleep. They're doing something simple like reaching up to comb their hair and they fall out, right? So that to me is where my radar goes off as opposed to exactly as you suggest, the exact position in which you get it in the office. Okay. Great, great, Paul. Now the next question uh, to the panel, I'll start with you, Man. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, Mandeep, uh, yourself. As to do you routinely incorporate the ISIS score uh, in these young patients? and you know, young and active patients? I think uh, ISIS score is a good tool, uh, but again, two most important things for me uh, that determine the indication or the type of surgery is the age at this dislocation. Again, not an absolute number, but we all know that less than 20 is a very high risk. For and the second is the extent of bone loss, uh, both on the hill sac side and more importantly on the glenoid side. The other factors like a contact aid, competitive overhead, you know, laxity, those are all important factors. But I think for me, age uh, and uh, the amount of bone loss goes more to the equation rather than putting up a score. Okay. Uh, Paul and Nikhil, would you agree to that or do you think differently? Nick, you go. No, I would say, um, do I use the score uh, as an... Uh, absolute indicator, meaning do I calculate it? No, frankly, you know, I think when you look across the literature, there's uh, very little ability to duplicate outside of France the exact correlation between the score and the recurrence rate. Um, I think the way the score is designed uh, would lead almost, you know, 50% or more patients to go probably procedures that are maybe um, uh, too invasive for the level of pathology. Having said that, what I do think the score is important for is making sure that we understand the various factors that can help um, uh, make determination 
and the appropriate indications for surgery, the appropriate surgical procedure and decision making. But I, I don't think the score per se is an absolute um, has been validated to allow us to use it in a clinical setting. Okay, great. Uh, any other difference of opinion or can we just move on? Yeah, I think fair enough because the last two, uh, you know, the points in this uh, score have not been really valid in last couple of yes. years. You know, the sclerotic line, the hill sacs lesion, but it does this, you know, investigation anymore. So you straight away strike off at least four, score, four points. And laxity is, it's extremely, you know, difficult to, you know, everybody is about four around, you know, so what's, what's, you know, what's significant, we don't know. Absolutely. And uh, so, yeah, the second thing is that competitive young athlete it automatically scores for uh, above four. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so, so this recent publication in Throscopy really showed that there's no correlation between treatment outcome and the ISIS score. And obviously, let us not forget that, you know, the concept of bone loss has been given more importance in the last decade or so. So obviously this score, uh, as we just mentioned, that the two points really looked at radiographs, but we know that that's not enough to evaluate bone loss. So the same group has come out with a modification of the ISIS score. And if you see the, the highlighted box, the bottom there, instead of the radiographs, they've included the 3D CT scan measurements. So it's important to kind of uh, uh, calculate the, the score in this modified form in the present day, taking into account the importance of bonus. So let's move on. And uh, Paul, if I may ask you, so when you see these first time dislocators uh, and you, you know, they present to you with just radiographs, uh, is that enough for you to uh, kind of make a decision or do you always, or do you them investigate in certain situations? So the majority of the time I'm seeing an athletic person and in, in the community, in, I think they're going to either come with an MRI or demand an MRI. So uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I more frequently will get an MRI than not. You might argue that I don't need it unless I'm intending to operate on them acutely. I, I, it's not required, but I think that's just a practice pattern in the demand of my social community. Okay, Vivek, just let's get an in perspective, please. No, I, I agree with Paul, even in India, um, one that people will land up with some kind of an investigation and more so i have always felt that i want to do these two investigation as a routine because i want to rule out any lesion but these two lesions never help me in making any decision you know except that sometimes you may see a bony bank card fragment but you would again not know that what's the size of this fragment what do i want to do so these two investigation never help me in making a final decision so i do it as a protocol rule out any lesion but not in my decision making okay nikhil uh, MRI for all primaries, MRI and CT for anybody with recurrent instability. Great. Mandeep? Yeah, for me, CT, if I suspect bone loss, and uh, MRI, as uh, you know, the other speakers have said, most of the time patients usually come with an MRI, but uh, unless I'm operating, I don't get an MRI. Okay. Uh, so, so the guys who don't get an MR, would you be doing certain special views to rule out bone loss? Vivek mentioned he does an MRI. But what about the others who don't? So I typically rely on a true AP and an actuary. They are well done. Uh, and usually if it's a recurrent dislocator, you can get it. Uh, I usually don't do any other view. Initially, I did Bernage views just to get it out of it. But uh, I mainly rely on AP and actuary. And FY, which is my theory. Okay, Paul? Yeah, look. I get an MRI. I, I certainly will try and get these views if I'm particularly worried about a hill sacs. Um, but the reality is that, you know, even some people are typing in no MRI or MRI for all my patients. If I don't get an MRI, they're going to go down the street to the next person. And when the person who get the MRI, they're going to come see me and have it with me. It just, this is how it works in my real life. Okay. Nikhil, now you mentioned that primarily you just get an MR CT in recurrent situations. Now, from MR, can you pre predict or estimate bone loss? In my opinion, you can't, um, which is what a CT in all recurrent cases. I think it was mentioned earlier, though, in the primary case, what you will see on an MRI is evidence of a bony bank heart. And if it, if it has any substance to it, I'll get a CT to get an exact uh, measurement of the actual bony fragment. But the chance of seeing, you know, you're not going to see attritional bone loss in a primary situation. So that's why I don't get a CT scan in those patients. Okay. Now, uh, an another addition to this is, suppose uh, if we were to operate on this uh, 
active first time dislocator in that situation uh, if the mri doesn't show any bone loss would one still go ahead and get a ct done or or no i would not no uh, do not the others hard. think any differently no 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 vivek yeah I, i you don't you don't need most of the time experience size you can pick up that there's no bone loss significant case okay so we're going to spend a little more time on this uh, first case because we want to discuss certain principles but and we'll come to the bone loss part a little bit later just to get a quick view from the panel that what's your technique of measuring bone loss on the glenoid side i'll start with you paul so i i'm going to do a perfect circle circle measurement on a 3d ct scan when i'm concerned about it do you include the contralateral shoulder we don't routinely no okay because studies seem to suggest that one is more accurate in estimating if you include it so i'm glad that uh, you know you someone who doesn't don't either uh, uh, mandeep nikhil uh, vivek think differently or do you include the opposite shoulder yeah our um, center protocol always includes the opposite side always to have a comparison <laughs> whether the circle method because some radiologists you know center they prefer the circle method some do the height and width method and they all do it the yeah, other side uh, mandeep same as paul not the opposite side just the ilaro uh, nikhil ct uh you you have to get the three reconstruction there's been a couple of papers i think matt uh preventure um did a nice study looking at axial views on a on a standard ct showing that you can significantly underestimate the degree of bone loss that's present so i think the 3d is critical and i use a, a circle method uh with a diameter based measurement and i do not get the opposite side okay great what about the humeral side i'll start with you vivek do you so so there are a few measurements obviously in the interest of time i haven't included everything but See, there is one which says you measure the percentage so less than 20% 20 to 40 and more than 40 there's another the uh, asian group which says hillsax angle and then we have obviously the on track off track concept so vivek uh, any particular thing you yes. consistently follow we go with the off track on track where they measure the hillsax index and not the angle or the percentage because percentage is a very flawed method and that doesn't work so we go with the off track on track on the ct scan now so does your radiologist do that in the reporting or do you actually go back and ask if you are you know concerned about something no the radiologist does that but we have also developed a small technique measure it intraoperatively and we have correlated that it's very significantly correlate with what do they measure so we are in a process of publication of that okay so uh, vivek has highlighted uh, uh, an important limitation at least in the indian scenario that you know a lot of time patients come with the mr and the so uh, they the the reporting radiologist may or may not have measured it and i'll come to what is uh, you know better intra op or you know measurement pre op so just moving on to mandi uh, again in these three methods what is your choice of uh, determining humeral sided bone loss so <clears throat> for me on method or radiologist we have a nih funded study so all the measurements are done by one radiologist and they are pretty reproducible so i rely on those so mandi just to kind of a little suppose if you had a patient who's got an uh, ct done from where the, what would you do i mean a different machine and maybe a slightly different protocol would you repeat it prior to your surgery or would you just ask your radiologist to comment whatever was available so usually outside studies are read by our radiologist and uh, you know uh, if if there are reasonable cuts to do a 3d if the 3d is not done like uh, nick said you know it's uh, important to have a 3d then we may repeat but most of the time i have not seen that to be an issue so time people so come with i actually I'm rather than, so i invariably will have my own cat scan most of the time i'm in a community practice where all cct is from a number of different centers and I'm held to make my own measurements and re- and do it on my own. I I don't have a a single radiologist who will who will do this in a consistent fashion, but I do rely on on the back off track. That's my methodology of preference. Okay, Nikhil. Uh so I think the first thing I do is measure the glenoid side because uh if you're above a critical level on the glenoid side, it doesn't matter what's going on with the hill sac lesion. You need a glenoid based reconstruction to solve that problem. if they have subcritical bone loss which can be below 10% in a contact or a collision athlete below 15% in most other individuals 
Then I'll use a, a on-track, off-track lesion if they have a significant hill sacs more than 15% to figure out if I'm going to add a remplissage soft tissue-based surgery. Okay. And now to my American three colleagues, uh, do you include a plain CT in this or do you just ask for a 3D CT? Well, 3D is really just a reformat of Helene. So you, you you would never get a 3D without the plane portion, I guess, is the short answer. No, so what I mean to say is, do you look at the films on the plane CT and look for something more or just the 3D information is enough? I mean, the measurement of uh, off track. I think for, uh, you know, off track on, obviously you're relying on uh, the Glenard width. So on 2D, you can measure Glenard width as long as it's a true axial plane. So uh, the short answer is that yes, 2D measurements are important. 3D is a nice visual and uh, lets you see uh, the Glenard better. But uh, I think 2D are equally important. And uh, right. as Nick said, you know, we just have to check a box for 3D. All of them get a 2D reconstruction followed by 3D reformatting. Okay. Yeah, I think the problem, Mandeep, is, is many of us make the assumption that when, when you're getting the cuts that the geologist has actually formatted the axial perpendicular to the long axis of the glenoid. And in most cases, they a bleak cut. And so when you do your measurement to come up with a diameter, you're actually measuring an oblique plane, which is why, um, as you said, you have to be very careful when you're measuring an oblique, excuse me, on axial cuts that they're actually in the plane perpendicular plane to the long axis of the scapula, which is or the long axis of the glenoid, which is pretty uncommon to see. Okay, great. Yes, no. uh, there, there is a funny point to add to this. You know, sometimes in our center also it has happened that we had a bony bank art lesion on the, which you can see on the D cuts, okay, in all the cuts. And the, during the reconstruction, it just removes that. Have sometimes <laughs> if you have only the 3D cuts, you will find there's a huge bone loss. But when you go back and see the 2D cuts, you've got a good repairable, you know, the bony bank cut. So yeah. uh, Nick said it's important to always look at all the cuts. Yes. Nice to Can I make a comment as well? I think it's a very good discussion on this uh, imaging studies because you know there's wide variation in practice. I just agree with Vivek. In my practice, the opposite uh, shoulder uh, comparison. Uh, it's easy to do a uh, substractional, three-dimensional, end-phase glenoid view of both shoulders to look at it. It gives you a very quick, clear uh, clinical impression of the glenoid bone loss, which is the key factor. The, the thing about the opposite side CT is that many CT scan centers, they do rotate both CTs, uh, both shoulders. They are yeah. automatically included, many centers. But what in reality is that they push only the shoulder you asked for in your system. So when you see, you will see only the right shoulder. But in reality, it is actually done on the console. So if you, if you request the radiographer, you just uh, take the image from the other side as well, priorly, then they will give you the image. So okay. this is what I learned. Uh, but sometimes what happens when you do, uh, when you include both shoulders, uh, make sure that it is completely included. Uh, great. So, Ram. Great. so young, active, first time dislocator, engages in overhead sports, uh, conservative, arthroscopic, bank cards repair, bone block procedure, or something else? So I think obviously this is a, a discussion with the patient. I would tell you that I've become much more aggressive over the last five years in managing these patients. I think the data is clear at this point that we understand the natural history of these conditions, which includes the risk of recurrence and the fact that um, oftentimes their prognosis as well as the intervention may change based on the number of recurrences they have. I would typically recommend dystopic stabilization in this patient. I think that if you elect to proceed with a non-operative course, what's really important is that you stress to the patient that if they have a second instability event, they need to see you sooner rather than later. Because I think what sometimes happens is if you say, there's nothing we need to do, you can live with this, we're gonna see what happens. They don't come back after the second dislocation, they come back five or six dislocations later, and it's a totally different problem at that point. Okay, great. Thanks, Nikhil. Now, Paul, in the interest of time, can I please ask you to just give me your choice of treatment? Arthroscopic bank card repair after Mandeep? discussion. Mandeep? Arthroscopic bank card repair if there's no uh, critical bone loss. Vivek, Indian perspective? Mm, I, I would ask you to find who's young, me or you or the guy. <laughs> this is the 21-year-old so we're talking about. 21, yeah. I, I would today, you know, tilt more towards the point number two, that's arthroscopic bank card repair. 
um, you know, especially if you have written active. If he is not, he says, no, I don't play anymore. So then I would again go with the next second point that you have that even if you get the second dislocation, you've got to come back immediately. Great. So uh, a recent, yes. recent yes. paper in uh, arthroscopy, once again, uh, meta-analysis shows that, you know, in this young active group, uh, uh, you know, a conservative management after a first time dislocation leads to a, a, a sevenfold recurrence rate. Or if you operate on them, the, the recurrence rate is sevenfold lower compared to conservative management. So this is something to think and perhaps counsel our young active people who want to engage in overhead sports after a first time dislocation. Although I must admit that in the Indian scenario, it's not always uh, possible for the patient to agree, but certainly there is, uh, uh, you know, one needs to put in a great emphasis, uh, taking into account the uh, the evolving evidence. So now let's just hey, look uh, at this. Karthik, can you hear me? Yes, Karthik, hi, welcome. So Karthik, good, I've got you at the time. So we are talking about a, a, a arthroscopy repair. I do my shoulders in BS, so this is the right shoulder. So Karthik, can you just quickly highlight five key points when doing a primary arthroscopic bank arts repair to ensure uh, a, you know, a higher level of success? Okay, for me, um, so the decision-making success, uh, obviously... No, I'm, I, sorry, I meant the surgical uh, treatment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Arthroscopic bank art repair, please. Thank you. So arthroscopic bank art, obviously, we'll have to start right with the positioning. So, uh, um, I do my um, arthroscopic bank art in lateral decubitus position. And uh, there are some studies which suggest that the lateral decubitus is better in success rate to the beach chair. Uh, uh, you know, so, Karthik, are, sorry, in the interest of time, I, I, I'm sorry to uh, interrupt you. What I, what I was trying to ask is that, what are the key steps will you do in terms of, you know, the, the labrum? So, suppose, as you see in this video, the, it, it's medialized. So, and, you know, in terms of uh, bone bed preparation and anchors and so on, what would be your five key uh, points? Okay, so uh, as I told you, positioning is very important and getting the portals right is very, very important. Getting your posterior portal right is very important let, let, uh, because basics are basic. If you get your posterior portal wrong, which means medial or two lateral, you're going to struggle the whole surgery. So getting the posterior portal right at the, at the right place is important. Then positioning your anterior portal and the anterior superior portal. So I use three portals. So the, and I use the anterior superior viewing portal and uh, anterior and the posterior working portals. And for the rump, I use a postrolateral, separate postrolateral portal. And so, so getting the portals right is the first key point. Yeah. Second thing is uh, mobilization of the labrum. So um, a retracted labrum like a Alpsa lesion, if you, if you are meaning, uh, meaning uh, a medially retracted labrum, which is healed medially onto the neck, you'll have to really place it along with the capsule and go all the way to the six or the seven o'clock position. Uh, Nikhil and others will actually put another anchor in the posterior inferior part um, to actually uh, augment your repair in the anterior by, by, by actually uh, tightening the hammock on the back as well. So something like a bank plus. So mobilizing the labrum is probably the key to success. Getting your uh, inferior most anchor at the right place again is very, very important. And uh, then capsular uh, Mobilizing the capsule and doing a capsular tightening as well along with the labral repair, like a, a, a real south to north pulling up of the labrum to tighten the hammock. That's the most important thing for success. Again, talking about decorticating the um, bone. If uh, I do it, I, I do decorticate the glenard a little bit for my uh, um, repairs, but uh, that's again discussion on whether to do it or not. Okay. Is that is that what you're asking? Yes, correct, correct. So, so that that's what we are probably looking at, and uh, this is the bird's eye view or the uh, SL portal view at the end of the primary bank card repair. So, yes. So, you know, the, to if you look at the pearls of a an arthroscopic bank card repair, uh, in primarily decision making, we need to assess for the bone loss. Uh, also, you know, visualize all possible pathologies, rule out an angle and alpsa lesion. Uh, another important factor what these have shown is that three or less anchors uh, is, is uh, uh, increase the risk of failure. Also importantly, you got to mobilize these capsular labral tissues and locate this. So my question to you, Nikhil, is that um, let's talk about the soft tissue first. So if you see a voluminous capsule, but you have a good quality labrum, do you almost always incorporate the inferior most bite through the capsule and the labral tissue or either? 
Yeah, so I think there are a couple important points here. Number one is, um, uh, as, as somebody stated earlier, we, we often will start our poster inferior quadrant rather than the anterior inferior quadrant. And I think it's important to be comfortable using the seven o'clock position so that you can do a north-south uh, shift instead of an east-west shift. And that allows you to take your first bite low down and shift it towards a, an anchor at the 530 position. I think that in reality, in many of these cases, once you mobilize the labrum, you can actually bring the labrum back to the glenoid face and shift it in a superior direction, which accompli accomplishes your, your or labral uh, plication. So it's about getting the labrum back into the right position, more so than it is taking huge bites of labrum, in my opinion, because I think if you over tension the capsule in a way, you're actually not getting the labrum back into the right position. So I try to mobilize the labrum and reduce the labrum to the glenoid anatomically, and then take about a, a five millimeter cap bite in addition to the labral tissue in order to, to uh, complete my repair. Okay, Vivek, uh, yeah. about suture anchor placement, do you go on the frame, do you go on the face, uh, or what do you prefer, and why? On the face, yes, because if you're too much on the there's always a chance of, you know, falling it out. So, I usually, you know, you want to get about two millimeter and then just a bit medial to that. So, it's always safer to be medial rather than, you know, I mean, medial mean on the face. Correct. So some people either mallet the sleeve to just engage or some people use a curette to just take a little bit of the cartilage off. So we're in the right spot, but too far medial is, uh, or rather too far on the face of the glenoid is also not good. Otherwise, you're going to really reduce the contact area of the, the glenoid. Paul, coming to you, uh, surgical aspects. I think we will all agree as panelists, the anti viewing from the anterior superior lateral portal to make sure that you mobilize the labrum all the way till you see the scab muscle is important. My question to you, Paul, is that for the fear most trans-subscap portal, never is it occasional or is it always for you? It's, it's an occasional for me. I think it's important to get down low enough in many of the new guides with smaller anchors. So I, I'm, I'm very I'm a big fan of smaller all-suture anchors. So if you can get low down enough, but I think it's very important to have your anchors enter perpendicular to the glenoid face because if you have three oblique drill holes, and I think you could become at risk for a postage stamp pressure, right? So, so to me, that's where if I can't get down low enough and, and with a curved entry device, I will go trans subscap percutaneously. One other question that seems to be coming up is the discussion of mattress uh, sutures or simples. And I think that's another thing that I've become in, in the last few years more of a fan of. I want to use a mattress suture at least, at least alternating in, in every other suture because I do believe it. it up a little higher, nicer bumper and some more surface area for healing. So yeah, great point, Paul. But uh, there's some concerns in publications about the anchor pullout uh, risk with press sutures. Uh, is that of a concern to you or, or not? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's a concern in general, when you have these younger people with reasonable bone, I don't think it's much of an anchor failure, and you're going to get a good hard pull on it before. So uh, I think if you're tying a good strong with a simple or with a mattress, you need it to hold irrespective, but it's a fair point. Okay, Nikhil and Mandeep, do you almost always use a trans subscribe port? Or you never? Just a quick uh, answer, please. Just in the interest of time. Thank you. I always use a simple, I always use a five o'clock, seven o'clock percutaneous portal just for my anchor guide. Great point. Uh, Mandeep? Uh, is Mandeep here? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was mute. Yes, uh, so a trans sub scan for placing the anchors, but uh, everything else from the anterior superior and anterior portal. Vivek, do you use a trans sub scan portal almost always? Okay. I've never used it. No, okay. Labrum and capsular shift we've already talked about. Now, uh, in a situation where there's not been recurrent dislocations and you know, go ahead to do an arthroscopic bank card repair, but the, the labrum quality is poor, but the capsule is repairable. Now, uh, as surgeons, coming to you, Mandeep, uh, does that increase the risk of failure? And if yes, do you think of adding a replica just to kind of uh, you know, take the tension off your repair? So I think if uh, the capsular tissue is repairable, it's not good quality. There's always uh, an increased risk of failure, but uh, I have not thought about adding ramplis arch to offset that risk but uh you know i think it won't be a bad idea but i personally have not done that uh, vivek ah anyway i love doing ramplis arch but in case yeah uh, 
it's it's i have seen very few cases where the you know the labrum was poor and then the capsule was also poor so actually in those cases i ended up doing you know the latage but i have done few cases we about 4 5 where the labrum was poor the capsule looked repairable and was not very demanding so we did this and it did work but i have also changed my mind immediately and did the latage okay uh, paul you know look i'm i'm what you're describing is i'm already scared of so i i just like vivek said if some poor quality tissue i don't know and they're a young person and this is unlikely a first time situation this is going to be someone who's dislocated 5 6 7 times i'm going to consider going open procedure whether it's an open capsule shift or whether i go to a bony procedure i think we we can sort of discuss but you you're certainly you're describing a situation that doesn't happen in isolation okay the next question nikhil to you is Uh, you know, often we see a, a glad type of lesion uh, just close to where we put, we want to put in the eye, and the bone quality may not uh, be very good. So, do you kind of try and cover the uh, the glad lesion uh, at the face of the glenoid during your ankle insertion, or or you wouldn't bother? Does it make a difference? Yeah. So, you know, the most common situation where we see this is actually in the posterior aspect with posterior labral tears. When I'll definitely try to cover it. In the front, most of the time when you see a true GLAD lesion, it's a it's a traumatic articular injury where you can sometimes incorporate the cartilage into your repair to try to get coverage. But if it's an actual uh, a degenerative situation and there's exposed bone there, I'm reluctant to put my anchors up on the face because I think you end up tightening them in external rotation too much. I'll, I'll more or less put them still in the in the same spot, but try to decorticate to get some bleeding and hopefully some fiber cartilage fill. But I think at the front, it's more often that you've got bone loss rather than actual exposed exposure of underlying cartilage, except in the more acute situation. Okay, Karthik. Now, often when we when we reach the upper part of the subscap, there's hardly uh, much labrum left uh, proximal to it. So, do you do you bother, you know, uh, fixing the remnant, or do you incorporate it with the MGHL and add another anchor, or, or it doesn't matter? I I add the MGHL to the repair at the three o'clock anchor. Okay. So at the three o'clock anchor, just at the level of the subscap, I include the MGHL, but above that, uh, I usually don't put an anchor. Mandeep. Yeah, for me, instability is within three. A lower half of the equator, so uh, none of my anchors go above that, and I don't do any kind of repair above three. Okay, great. Just in the interest of time, moving on to fixation techniques. Now, obviously, a lot of configurations have evolved uh, with growing evidence. So, uh, just a question to uh, to you guys, uh, coming starting with Nikhil, have you changed your suture pattern from a simple to cinch or tape or mattress over the years? It really matter. So I use uh, double loaded simple. Um, I don't think it really matters. Uh, you know, we looked at this biomechanically about ten years ago, and there was really no difference in stitch configuration. Um, I, I like the simple. Uh, I like the double loaded because it gives me two points of fixation for every anchor. But otherwise, I haven't changed. Okay, uh, guys, what about uh, moving on from knotted to knotless anchor, Paul? Still, I, I, you know, load low down. I don't know if knotless is as easy to get. So, like Nick said. I, Mattress or a, a single or a double loaded low down. As they move up the face, I really enjoy the knotless anchors a lot. Okay, what about the the type of anchor? Have you guys uh, moved on from peak to bio, and perhaps uh, uh, someone is using an all suture now for instability? Mandeep? No, uh, I'm not using all suture anchors. My partners are, uh, so I still rely on uh, bio. Okay. Yeah, I moved completely to. Suture. What I like about it is the fact that you can uh, uh, drill a very small pilot hole. Many of them are in the 1.6 millimeter range, so you can get multiple points of fixation. In the setting where you could typically put in three, you can now get four, sometimes five anchors. Okay, Vivek. In an Indian scenario, the all suture anchors are slightly cheaper. So, yep. uh, have you moved on to all suture or or, or not? So mine is a kind of a combination. I'm still, you know, a bit uh, sometimes scared. So I load the five o'clock is always double loaded. Single anchor, double loaded. So I usually take either the mattress combination of simple, but then above I have moved to the all switch anchors and maybe sometimes the knotless. As you know, Paul said it's. I mean, Mandeep said it's much more easier. And just in note, note on this cinch, I'm sure that all of you would have seen once in a while. Rarely, not very common. The labrum is a kind of a discontinuous on the top, somewhere around two o'clock. You know, two o'clock, three o'clock situation. So I usually put a cinch knot there first. 
and I pull the whole thing, take all the bites, and then I knotless anchor and jam it on the top using the cinch knot. So that's the only way to take the cinch knot. It's not required. Okay. Now, what literature mentions is that with the uh, you know the introduction of the all suture, perhaps when you have an extensive labral tear, it really helps because you don't want to cause and, the and all suture and anchor always on the posterior. Right. And as Paul mentioned, yes. you don't want a postage stab type of a fracture situation later on. So yes, but you know, despite all this, what is important is a meticulous uh, fixation technique. Whether you use knotted versus knotless or whatever material you use, really has uh, little importance in the success of the procedure. But a proper technique is the key. So now another interesting thing, uh, and Nikhil, I'm going to ask you this. This publication says that. you know obviously because of a concern with higher failure rates with an arthroscopic bank card repair and i'm not talking about significant or subcritical bone loss these authors who are very senior as you can note suggest that after a primary repair you immobilize them for 6 week uh, unless it's someone's an overhead athletes where 4 weeks but importantly only go to half the extension at 3 months from surgery now do you really do that and and if so is there a concern in regaining the the symmetrical external rotation subsequently uh i'm really conservative with these patients so i do a sling for 6 weeks for the vast majority the overhead athlete is the is the difficult point because for them loss of range of motion in external rotation will essentially eliminate them from from being able to throw with any velocity um i shoot for about 30 degrees of external rotation uh at 6 weeks and i would like them to have somewhere around 60 to 70% of motion recovery at Once I tell them they probably won't have uh, motion to within five degrees of the opposite side until eight to twelve months. Great. Yeah, I think this is very important for all of us to recognize that despite uh, you know the evolving strong anchors that we have in the present day, the rehab really needs to go slow because we want the healing to happen. So you can't rush through biology. Now, Paul, coming on to you, uh, in terms of uh, the problem, I. i face in india is that you know the patients have to go locally for physio now even though we send in a program sometimes they end up doing whatever they like and at times patients are anxious that it's 3 months of symmetrical external rotation how do you deal with this or do you really encounter this in the us situation so i have to rethink my things i i have them wear a sling for 4 weeks i have them get motion and at 6 after 6 weeks i go for full range of motion so i am much more aggressive in my range of motion i allow them return to sport for about 5 months uh maybe even sooner if it's a ladder j so i i don't know that i'm that conservative and and i'm actually i i'm i don't want them to be that tight so i have to think more about what i'm doing here because i'm outside the lines okay okay great now let's move on to the next uh, situation so this is a 32 year old sedentary individual had a fall from a motorbike presented to us with uh, two weeks later so he's got a instability lesion and a rotator cuff we'll focus on the instability so this is his imaging uh, as we know there is a reasonable size uh, you know bony bank card yes. with not yes can you just can yes. you just back to x ray for a while yes yeah fair enough and that's the it's reason one must do you know yeah this you one. know the the views are important but you know you can never get the actual idea of those fragments that's where this is of correct Now, uh, just again, we've discussed the basics. Moving on to surgery, and please, a one-word answer if possible. I know it's never easy. Conservative arthroscopic card repair, incorporating fragment bone block procedure, other Karthik. You have mute card, perhaps. I would do arthroscopic bank card. Incorporating the fragment, or it doesn't really matter. This this fragment, this size fragment. Yeah, definitely operating the fragment. Yes. Okay. Uh, Paul, I'll follow Karthik's lead. Okay, And, uh, Mandeep. Yeah, orthoscopic card repair incorporating the fragment. Nikhil, same or different? Same. Same. Vivek? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Now, in terms of fixing these bony cards, uh, do you do it similar to a soft tissue, or do you try and take a bite through that fragment which I just showed you? Do you go for something as shown in the photograph on the right, like a dual row bridge fixation? Uh, obviously, you guys have not asked for a bone block, so the fourth option is excluded. Uh, I'll start with uh, Nikhil, please. So I typically with double row this type of repair. Uh, I'll start by putting an in, in, uh, all suture tenable knotless anchor above and below the fragment. I'll leave it slightly loose so I can tension it later. I'll then put a percutaneous uh, anchor. through the capsule medial to the fragment 
I'll bring those sutures around. I'll tension the top and sutures to reduce the bank heart and then take the medial row and lay it on top of the, at the fracture interval with two um, push lock type implants. Right. Have any of you guys tried to uh, take a bite through a reasonable size fragment? Uh, and is it, is it really easy? Uh, so Mandeep? Uh, no, I think it is hard. Some people try to drill with the K-wire and then use that. But I think uh, the fragment, it, it's very hard to penetrate that because there's, uh, the fragment is slipping away. One thing you can do is you can stabilize that fragment with the K-wire because you're not using K-wire for anything. So direction really doesn't matter. And then you may, but I have uh, not seen but heard of cases where people have broken the tip of the suture trying to pass it through the bone. So, you know, I would do what Nick said, you know, put two medial, two medial row anchors and then uh, bring them over the top and uh, dunk them in. Yeah, I mean, Suga has described, you know, special instruments to try and pierce the fragment, but certainly it's never easy. So there you see in the video piece being elevated and we're trying to reduce it back. Uh, you can see that piece going through. So I did a circumferential kind of fixing and that's what it looked like at the end. Uh, so that's the post-op uh, x-ray of that. Now, uh, importantly, you guys have rightly said so that, you know, a, a bony bank, even though it means uh, subcritical bone loss, does not equal to a bone uh, block type of procedure. And Sukhya in these two publications has so shown that even in a chronic situation, one can retention the, the IGHL and, you know, reduce the fragment. So try and attempt that first uh, unless there is a massive bone loss or resorption rather than to go for a bone block procedure. Now, this is the third situation. Uh, yes. Uh, is the time up is indeed to wind, wind up, 10, I think. 10.25. So we've got five minutes, I believe. So this... Uh, okay. Right, uh, because it's the, the reason is it's midnight for Americans. <laughs> sure. Uh, you guys okay if we put in through his last case? Yeah, last case, yes. Thank yeah. you. So this is a 25-year-old male uh, who has dislocated his shoulder during seizures, reduced in A&E, then he was referred subsequently from uh, further management. So, uh, Nikhil, uh, can you please comment on the uh, CT films? Yeah, yeah. The first thing I would say, as soon as you see the word seizure, you've got to be uh, completely concerned about anything that you're going to do in this patient because your your chance of success is going to be small unless that's controlled. What I would say is, uh, obviously, he's got a critical bone defect on the glenoid side and and at least a medium hill. What I think is important is if you look at that on face view, one of the things we've published on is when you start to see that linear appearance of the glenoid in the front, that tells you you've got at least, there you go, you've got at least a minimal 12 to 13% defect. So just by looking at it alone, as you see that linear aspect, you know you're into at least a subcritical approaching critical zone. Yeah, absolutely. So this needs a bone, a bone procedure. Correct, Nikhil. And this really is a, is a key point that, you know, from this, you know, you're dealing with subcritical bone loss. So I'll just go on to the the evolving concept of bone loss, the on-track, off-track uh, concept. Uh, we all know that. And we all know the algorithm. So just moving on to uh, the decision-making in terms of uh, adding or emplissage or doing a bony procedure. So Vivek, now you mentioned that you to make that decision intra-op. And how do you do that? No, no. no. Shreyas, I didn't say that. I said that you can also correlate it intra-op. But okay. my decision is always pre-operative. Okay. It's always. Now, Sometimes okay. if I'm in dilemma, like to do not, and I will always see it intra-op and we have an instrument which we can measure and correlate again in a drop and then take a call. But my, I have always tilted more towards emphasize my in last uh, seven years, whatever recurrences have happened, they have always happened. I mean, almost always a few have happened in non emphasize cases, even if the hill sacs was smaller. So I have a very serious bias for the emphasis. Okay. So just in the interest of time, I'm just trying to, uh, you know, give, highlight this, that it is very difficult in drop to determine whether it's an off track lesion because uh, E.G. Itoy has shown that the only way you can assess is after repairing the bank card stair, and you know you will compromise your repair. So really, you have to make that decision pre-operatively. Now, uh, choosing a remplissage versus a bone block procedure. Um, Nikhil, what are your thoughts? Yeah, my, my thoughts, I, I look at the glenoid first. That's your critical zone. If you're into a critical lesion on the glenoid side, then remplissage is off the table. This patient, um, you know, we can we can talk about whether you need remplissage as an augment in larger size hill sacs lesions in association with a bone defect, and you can do an uh, off-track, on-track lesion incorporating the latter J. 
this case, the, I don't even think a discussion of remplissage is relevant because you need to address the glenoid side. Once you do that, the Hill sacs lesion is no longer a consideration. Having said that, if, you're, if your glenoid lesion is subcritical, meaning less than 10%, then I think the track lesion is helpful in determining remplissage is going to be an appropriate additive for an arthroscopic procedure. Okay. Um, right. Now, so, so yes, that I agree with what Nikhil has to say, but if you look at literature, what it says is that in, in situations you have a subcritical bone loss, and there's this comparative study from young girl Rees group, which said you can choose a remplissage versus a lethargy, and there's no difference in terms of recurrent instability. But obviously the study showed that there were higher non-instability related complications in the J group. So really you can offer a, a, a remplissage just uh, you know, if it fails, then you can perhaps, uh, you know, think of uh, doing a bo bony block procedure unless there is more than subcritical bone loss. So, you know, there are different ways to skin a cat. I try and do it subromially. I use the knotless uh, suture bridge type of concept and just bring it through the final, uh, you know, view. This, you know, we kind of go to the subcromial side, really uh, uh, tension it, and then look into the glenoid side and make sure that we get the latest tendon right into the hill sacs defect. Uh, and that's what we achieve. And so obviously, there, there is a school of thought that there's restricted external rotation, but these are two patients. You can see that they've got their symmetrical external rotation. So it's not a big concern. But, um, well, you know, again, Nikhil and group have published this saying that if it is a subcritical uh, bone loss, then really remplissage is, uh, is a way forward to reduce your chances of failure from an exclusive bank card repair. Really my threshold of doing a remplissage has gone less and less, as Vivek mentioned, just to make sure that, you know, hopefully we can reduce the failure rate. Oh, uh, oh there's one more. Yes, sir. Yes. One. Yes. Yes, Vivek. Yes, just one word, what Nick was saying. See, we must, when we make the decision of remplissage versus letargy, there's also an issue of regional occupation and the cultural, you know, you know, the factors which we have to consider. The people in U.S. are the... Uh, the population, they might not accept this or they might not be better off with just the bank card and besides frequency, it might be higher as we always in Asians or, you know, the our people who may not play. So it may still work in arthroscopic bank card and remplissage and then more aggressive patients, you might have to do lethargy for the same bone loss and the same health sex lesion. Yes. Correct. Whereas, and, uh, whereas, whereas if, I want yes. to add that uh, the complications of lethargy are just overemphasized again and again. I don't lethargy is such a complicated procedure. I think for people who routinely do letage, uh, the complications are very minimal, non-instability complications like neurological injuries or whatever, uh, can be kept very minimal and uh, they are most reversible. They don't need any second intervention. So for to, you don't need to shun that operation. It's a good operation. Correct. Now, uh, just a word of caution of remplissage in throwers. Studies have shown that they, they will lose their, you know, even a smaller degree of external rotation loss is you know, important. So we need to try and avoid that. Uh, so I think that pretty much uh, kind of sums it up. And I, I'll just say that the take-home message is that first time patient, active patient, early surgery as per current evidence is beneficial. Bony bank card, chronic or acute, or fix it. Subcritical bone loss. Think of adding a remplissage or a bone block if it is a collision or athletes. Critical uh, glenoid bone loss have form of a bone block procedure. And I had a fifth case, but obviously we couldn't go through it. And so that pretty much it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you Thanks. Thanks a lot. You thank wonderful. you, everyone. Excellent. Uh, I think it was a fantastic. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. For I think thank you for, for staying uh, night. I think it's close to midnight now, right? 12? 12 or 4. <laughs> thank you. We are just overshooting by five, seven minutes. I hope it's okay. Now, I'd like to uh, welcome Murthy and Ranjan Gupta to give the closing remarks for this uh, meeting. Thank you. Well, I want to do uh, everyone for joining us on this transcontinental uh, session. They're great. I think this is a, a great way to do this now future. I've talked with Samir tonight and I think maybe the next one will even do some more video technique from both sides of the, of the ocean. And I appreciate everyone coming on late tonight from both sides. It's, we're just going to keep building and building this relationship. Uh, and it's been great to listen to. I appreciate all of your time. Thank you. And only thing I have to add to that is that we've all learned on both sides of we are doing things. We can learn from one another. And I think there's an opportunity to, we need to, in the next few months, figure out a way to 
share our results with a broader shoulder and elbow audience at large. So others can benefit from our wisdom. And I think that's going to be one of our charges for leadership moving forward is not just to have these, to expand beyond that. Yes. So with that, I, uh, I compliment everyone that have been here and look forward to the next session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Samir, uh, Thank Paul, you. Nikhil. Great Mandi, job, everyone. Thank you. And the Indian team. Thanks, Ram. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This was a great night. night. Uh, thank you all. Paul, Nikhil, is here as well. I didn't see before. Thank you. Good night. Hey, good night. Thank you, Neeraj.